I'm Deb Clumbera. I'm the current chair of the Northeast Ohio Technical Services Librarians. I want to welcome you to the 2022 Spring NOTSL meeting. Um, for those of you attending, this will be a very informative session with overviews and demonstrations of both Tableau and counter software. And my white you my mm, <laughs> why you might wish to add this to your professional portfolio. Our first speaker will have, as part of his talk, the opportunity for you to learn along with him. So um, if you haven't already, take advantage of downloading the free 14-day trial of Tableau at tableau.com slash products slash trial. Before we get started, however, I'd like to ask Margaret Maurer, our election committee chair to talk about the election of officers in which all of you as attendees may take part. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. I want to welcome you also to attend what I hope will be a very interesting meeting. Not so exists because the board uh, of total volunteers actually does all the work to prepare these meetings and then uses that money for other educational pursuits. And if it wasn't for the people on the board, the hardworking people that make things happen, we would not exist. And um, I wanna take this opportunity really quickly to thank everyone who was willing to run for office because we are for the most part an elected board. And um, I want to urge you to take a look. There are links in the chat where there's candidate biography information and there is um, information, a link to where it is that you go to vote and the voting is anonymous. Now, ask yourself why, if I am simply attending this meeting, I get to vote. Knotsville doesn't have traditional membership. We decided a long time ago that creating a role of members and maintaining it and paying the money to get people to pay their dues and keeping track of all of that. We didn't make enough money off of that to do that anymore. So what we decided to do was to make the attendees of the spring meeting, the people that get to vote for the candidates for office. And so please take a couple minutes at some point this morning look at the candidate biographies and decide who you want to vote for and help us make this important decision. So um, we will announce the winners um, towards the end of the business meeting today at lunchtime. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Voting has been open and will continue this morning, but I think it's gonna close around 11 a.m. So please take time and, and vote now. Um, so I want to thank everybody who agreed to run for office. I wish them good luck. We appreciate your service to the organization and would love to have all of you participate. And now on to our morning program, Tableau. As a user of Tableau, I'm excited to hear about how others are going to use Tableau. Um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker today, Nathan Putnam. Nathan is Director of Quality and Governance at OCLC, where he heads a team of specialists focused on data quality policies and standards for WorldCat data assets. He has 20 years of cataloging and metadata experience in multiple US academic libraries as a cataloger and as a manager. Nathan's talk is entitled, Creating a Tableau Dashboard to Analyze Descriptive Data and we'll include the work along exercises on building a dashboard if you choose. I give you Nathan Putnam. Nathan, it's you're up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deb. Um, and uh, just to get started, we have a couple links. I, I did put the uh, Tableau free trial link in there after Deb mentioned that in the chat. And also, um, Rebecca has just put in. Um, a Google Docs folder um, that has some of the files that we're using. And I'll bring them up again when we get to those different pieces um, for today's presentation. 
Uh, I am extremely excited to be kind of sharing this with you. Um, and I'll talk about my journey with Tableau uh, as we go on as well, um, as we get started. So uh, as Deb said, data quality and governance uh, within OCLC. Um, one of the things in addition to the teams and is related to the, the governance piece is just the analysis of um, data. And as you can imagine, WorldCat has a ton of data in it. And so there's quite a bit for us to be able to analyze and the technology and the tooling is sophisticated enough to where we can do some, some pretty neat things, uh, analyzing all of the different things from holdings to formats, um, to even like mark field uh, usage over time, all those sorts of really good things with the WorldCat data. <clears throat> But what uh, I wanted to do in this particular session was just to create a uh, simple dashboard, and I'll qualify that, that this is going to be relatively simple, but it's also meant to be interactive as you are, are doing this. And um, Stephanie Church, who is the presenter after me, she and I met a couple times to discuss kind of things that we're doing. And so what kind of came from that is that I would walk you through kind of the Tableau setup and getting things started um, uh, and, you know, various things like that. And then she would go through some of the uh, dashboards um, or use cases that are out there for people for people doing this. The one thing that I, uh, I have said uh, with, or I've noticed with Tableau is there's a little bit of a steep learning curve for this. So if this is your first time experiencing Tableau, I think you will be um, appreciative of the simpleness of this dashboard, um, just as you get used to the way that Tableau refers to items and, and different things like that. <clears throat> um, as mentioned in the, in the uh, description and uh, uh, overview of this is that um, this can be used as an interactive session. So if you are interested in following along and going through the exact same steps, you have all that information um, available to you right now. And so there was the link to the trial um, that does require a little bit of you have to fill out your name and things like that. So if you haven't done it already, it might be best just to watch. Since this is recording, you'll always be able to go back to this. Um, I will also send. I, I will also have in that Google Drive folder the um, the files that we end up creating the workbook, so that you can go down and play play around with it later on. Um, I've done this kind of training twice within OCLC for uh, our internal ingest group and then my quality group. And the number one comment that I got from this is uh, two monitors, extremely helpful. Um, so if you, because I will be showing things on the screen and then you will have to switch over to look what's going on in your dashboard. So another possibility is that if you don't have two monitors, you may just wanna kind of watch or follow around and get some ideas, take some notes. Um, uh, or if you have a large monitor, you might be able to do the two things side by side, but that's that's just always uh, useful information to know. So in the Google Drive folder um, that is that is in the chat, uh, there are uh, a couple files. The file that, um, well, the top file, I realize this is really small, there you go. The, uh, the top file is just a copy, a copy of these presentation slides. Um, the second fly, file is the uh, data set that we're going to use. And so if you are following along, um, go ahead and click on, or download rather, this Excel file and save it in a place that you know, because we're going to connect to it in a second. And then the understanding pill types is a, it, these are notes that I've taken based on a presentation or rather a video um, that Tableau has done. And I'll touch on this again once we get to that. Uh, place. All right. Um, first up, um, Tableau. Uh, for those of you not as familiar with it, this is an analytics platform. It's used by companies all over the world. It allows you to analyze and track and in some cases clean up and maintain data that you and your organization are using. And it, I'm gonna focus on um, mark record descriptive metadata things, but as you'll see in Stephanie's, there's lots of stuff you can do with acquisitions data, um, or if you have the data in some kind of format um, that Tableau will recognize, you can do almost anything with this. Uh, I was working on um, a degree a couple of years ago, 
uh, at Ohio State University. And one of the classes that I took was a data visualization class. And this uh, taught me quite a bit about Tableau and just the world of data, data visualization, storytelling with data, best practices and various things like that. Um, <clears throat> That really got me excited about Tableau and, you know, thinking again, WorldCat has a ton of data in it. Um, how can I use Tableau to really highlight the data, um, the things that my teams do to impact WorldCat, the things that the OCLC members do to impact WorldCat, um, those kinds of things to really help that out. So over the last couple of years, we've been building kind of this um, data data storage uh, for, for staff within OCLC to where we can kind of get our data in a, in a usable shape and then connect services up like Tableau, or you may also be familiar with Power BI, which is a Microsoft product, um, and really get out of the world of Excel. Because I think most of us, um, at least when I was in library land, a lot of the data schlepping was done through Excel, analysis was done through Excel. And while that works, um, you can do so much more with the storytelling and um, creativity. I, I think there's a lot of creativity that is built into these, these visualizations like Tableau that Excel kind of uh, can lack in. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's a personal preference. And if you love Excel and you get great visualizations out of it, by all the more means, you know, use the tool that's comfortable with you. But I'm hoping that by showing you this, the Tableau um, version, we're going to kind of see the different possibilities that uh, are out there. All right, so over the course um, of the next 45 minutes or so, um, we're gonna do some high level basic things that will get you into, uh, into Tableau. And the first thing we need to do, of course, is connect Tableau to the data source. Once we get done with connecting Tableau, we need to create our data points. So these are all of the things that we are gonna monitor in our dashboard um, that we can use to uh, tell the story of uh, what our data is giving us. And, and finally, we're gonna build the visualization. So that was that visualization that I had back on this first slide. <clears throat> Stephanie works at Case Western Reserve. Um, and so uh, with their permission, I thought, well, well, let's use a real library example. Um, and so we're going to look at their original cataloging for this, and we're going to make it kind of an interactive where I can choose different formats um, for this uh, and basically allow people to kind of go through and, and do some stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize, I keep clearing my throat. I was traveling this weekend, and I'm pretty positive I um, pick something up. So uh, I will try to keep that at a minimum. But if I randomly go on mute, it's likely because I, uh, I'm gonna, I need to cough. All right, so I'm gonna deviate from the slides now. The, 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 the next couple of slides in the deck just cover what I'm actually doing, but because I wanted this to be a live demo, um, I'm gonna veer away from the slides and instead go into a Tableau workbook. And so when you first open Tableau, um, if you've used the desktop before, then you've seen, uh, you, you'll have something like this where you'll have some of the different items that you have used before. You can pin different items as well. Um, but this is kind of, this is the first step into getting into Tableau. Um, now I should mention that uh, I'm taking a very, Narrow is not quite the right word, but I'm taking a specific slice into the Tableau universe. There are several different flavors of Tableau. There's Tableau Online, there's Tableau Desktop, there's Tableau Server, um, and they all, some are free, some are kind of free, some require costs, some require setup, like you can imagine the server um, might require, or may require IT space at your university, that sort of stuff. There are different requirements when it comes to being able to publish materials to um, different sites, whether it's Tableau online or your Tableau server so that people can use. There's also three different licenses right now for uh, Tableau users. You have the, um, uh, the basic one that it just allows users to view stuff. You have one, a middle intermediary one where 
the data source is already published somewhere for you, such as Tableau server, um, and that you're building off an existing data source, or there's the full explore license um, that allows you to do any and everything um, with, with Tableau, including the kind of the desktop stuff. So you can actually download the desktop items, um, uh, but I believe that there's some restrictions around savings and things like that. So all of this was just to say is right now, uh, Tableau has multiple different flavors out there. And I'm specifically focused on the um, Tableau desktop and I have a, a license to it. So I'm gonna be able to save these things to my uh, desktop uh, computer. Um, and, and so if, if anything kind of looks weird, it might be like that, uh, it might be like that. Um, just the different license or version that you have for this. Like, I think several of us hopefully are familiar with Microsoft Office. There's a Windows, uh, rather there's a browser version where if you're in Chrome or Edge, you have Word functionality in there. And then you also have the Word client and there's different functionality between the two. So if you get into more of the um, uh, Tableau usage, like you can do quite a bit of stuff for free. Um, with an online version, publishing your data to Tableau online um, and various things like that. Just remember if you're using your institution's data and you are using Tableau online, um, you know, make sure that that's okay to publish your data sources to the web um, and have a different kind of repository out there for that. Uh, Mark data is probably not sensitive, but definitely acquisitions cost data. Um, you want to make sure that your uh, permissions are all set right. And if this shouldn't be viewed, um, they're hidden and things like that, if you do do, do that. So <clears throat> lots of different things, lots of different flavors with Tableau. Again, I'm working with Tableau Desktop um, just to be able to show you this and give you an idea of what is going on with Tableau. All right. So uh, if you are following along or if you're just watching the video, uh, we have our Tableau desktop open. And what I want to do is I want to connect to a data source. Now, if I had access to a Tableau server, this data was on, I could access there. I can also access to a file and I get, um, oops, not quite yet. Uh, this is just going to dump me into um, my Windows, or I'm on a Windows, you can use this on a Mac as well, but uh, uh, just dump this into get the particular file. And then also, this may be particularly useful if your institution allows you to connect to different data sources. Um, there are, you know, a good 30 plus data sources that are here that allow you to cook it, connect to data sources. And some of them are like, you know, Box or um, Google Drive are on here. So if you're storing data in the cloud and you have multiple people in there, you have an excellent, um, excellent chance that one of these will actually work. And now that I come to think about it, I probably could have connected to Google Drive uh, for this, but I just, um, I'm not, I, I haven't used that before. So uh, I, I don't wanna run into that, especially in the live demo. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna connect to Microsoft Excel. And um, before, just a reminder, before we do that in the uh, Google Drive fol folder, there's the CWR um, original format counts. Um, this is an Excel file. You want to download this uh, to your machine in a safe place because then when we connect to a file, so I'm to a file, Microsoft Excel, you're going to navigate to where your, uh, you downloaded your data, uh, downloaded your data, and then we're just going to double click this so that it opens the data. All right. The very first thing you'll notice is kind of the layout. We have the Excel file format um, name up here, and we have, we've actually brought the file over here. Now, what you can do is create uh, kind of a, a larger data source by connecting data sources right through Tableau. Um, uh, you can add different, doesn't have to be in Excel, you could add other uh, format types, you could connect to server data, all that sort of stuff. Right now, we're just gonna be working on um, this one Excel sheet. Um, pointing down here in the left-hand corner, we have our data source tab. That's the tab that we're in right now. And then we have the sheet one where we're gonna start to create our data. And I'll go into this in, in a second. 
But what is always good when, um, once you start to actually see your data is just to validate it in some regards. And so, and, and if you're not familiar with where the source came from, let's say you're, uh, you're an acquisitions person looking at this and you're cataloging friend, put the data set together. You're gonna wanna just verify that you understand the da data the way that they created the data for you um, and, and make sure that everything is correct. And uh, I will say for this demo, I have massaged the data a little bit. So for those of you at Case, Case Western, if you start looking at, um, hey, these numbers aren't quite right or something's, something's off about this. I, I, I did just, I took some stuff out just so that it would be easier as part of the demo. Um, and so uh, I'm more than happy to refresh the data uh, down the road. I just wanna make sure that we're all there. The other thing to note, um, and we'll end up putting it in our visualization, is that this data is from January 2022, so it's not a current June 1st or something like that snapshot of the data. So there may be some minor differences if you're searching in, um, in WorldCat to see uh, these different counts. Uh, this is a fairly simple data source. I do have uh, four different format or four columns. I have a format, a subformat, category, and then account. Um, what I did here, what we want to look at is basically what are the different formats that have been um, cataloged, originally cataloged at Case Western. And then a lot of things today, at least at OCLC, we're, we're always looking at what is physical uh, items versus what is an electronic item. And so I created a category that designates, well, um, an audiobook CD is going to be a physical resource, as opposed to if we look down here, an online ebook basically is going to be an electronic resource. So this was a category that I created um, to help kind of uh, tell the story about the number of e-resources versus the number of physical resources that have been cataloged. And then the final column we have over here are the counts um, for these different things. Like I said, fairly simple. I believe this is uh, 42, looks like it's 35 rows. Um, what I would want to do is like, so for VHS, if I'm, if I'm able to access my system or in WorldCat, just check that maybe 239. Uh, that's correct. I did a little bit of that today. Um, and so I'm hoping that this is as accurate as it's going to be. All right. Next up then is we actually want to start creating uh, the data points that we're going to uh, that we're going to use in our final visualization. Um, we're going to use this by creating four sheets. We're going to do a format table and do an original records count, total e-resources count, and total physical e-resources count. And why I have this split out will become clear once we start building the dashboard. Um, just to have these highlighted. Um, we are gonna do some formatting um, of the data elements, and this is just dealing with font and colorization. Again, we're trying to tell the story here, so we want it to be in a presentable fashion. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll give some um, tips about telling stories and who the audience is, things like that. And the one slightly, um, less straightforward thing is we're going to add a selection parameter because I do want this to be interactive. And the format selection is going to allow me just to narrow in to books or to, um, well, any of these uh, main category formats. That's what I should have said. So we have format and subformat. And basically what this is, is the overarching category for this is like books or audiobooks, computer files. And then each of the format types has a subformat associated with it. So a manuscript, a thesis, continuing resource, braille, microform, print, large print. And so that kind of digs down a little bit to say, you know, we could say we're doing, um, what is this, 40, 50, 50 some thousand books, but it'd be really interesting to know, oh, you know what, a lot of these are theses and the vast majority of them are print books and have that kind of kind of split out like that. Okay. So um, hopefully for those of you following along, you are all with me. Um, if you do want to interrupt me, I do have the chat up. Um, in case I, I, it is a little, when I did this at OCLC, it was useful because, um, you know, participants were 
well, first of all, there was only like seven or eight in each of the groups. And then, um, you know, we could talk back and if I needed to go back and reshow something, I could. So if there are things that um, anyone does want me to reshow as I go through, just let me know. All right. So um, we're going to do a table. And um, one of the reasons to do a table first, uh, if you look at other resources that are out there, they often suggest kind of looking at your data. Again, this is to check the accuracy to make sure you are presenting, you have accurate data that is along with this. And so um, our, in terms of layout, we have our big sheet here in the middle. This is where the different element points are all going to live. Um, a lot of times this is overkill in real estate, um, but you'll see sometimes it'll make sense because you might have a large graph or you might have um, a lot of different data elements on there. Um, but we definitely have um, a lot of real estate here. Much like um, Excel, uh, you're talking about columns and rows uh, for the different things. So these are going to be important as we're putting different data elements in. And then we have the information from our uh, our, our table from our data source. And so we have the category, the format, um, subformat, and then measure names. And the measures here are just to really show uh, everything. If I wanted to throw everything on the graph, I could just do measure names. And then the important piece down here is the count. This is the number of items that are on here, um, uh, as we saw in that, in that data element. Now, uh, for those of you who are following along, or if you can see it in a tiny small font, we do have some symbols indicating what different data types are. We have the pound sign, and this happens to be green. I'll talk about colors in a second. Uh, and then we have ABCs next to all of these, and that happens to be blue. Now, intuitively, this should make sense because when we looked at our data source, these are just um, text fields for all of this. And then the counts, of course, are going to be a number. You can set a variety of these, if we needed to be decimal, date and time, date, string, Boolean, um, you can set these manually. A lot of times uh, Tableau is smart enough that it's gonna know exactly what, um, what it is. Uh, one thing, especially with library data, is that we often use um, standard identifiers. If you're in WorldCat, you'll look at the OCLC number quite a bit. Um, you may have a local bib number for your system. We're not actually gonna treat those at num as numbers because you're not going to add or subtract things to them. And so in that case, you can just very easily change this to change your identifiers to a date, or excuse me, not a date, a string um, for that. All right. Now, um, I did mention the colors here as well. So this is green and this is um, blue. And when we click on it, we get this pill shape. Um, and to me, this is one of the, this was one of the, more difficult things uh, for me to grasp with Tableau. And so what I've done with, um, uh, with them is that I created, uh, I took some notes on understanding pill types. And so I have, I think I have it up natively. There we go. Um, these are my notes that you're feel, feel free to take that are from um, a video tutorial about understanding pill types. And, uh, what, let's see here, where is it? Do, do, do. There we go, understanding pill types. Um, so this is just a video that kind of walks you through. What's really nice about it is that it kind of shows you how things work together um, in terms of like continuous and discrete dates, the green, um, the green and the blue, which uh, do, do, do. we have the um, measures and the dimensions. And then we have continuous, which is green, and discrete, which is blue. So measures here, these tends to be the metrics or the new numeric data. Um, and so when we looked at our dashboard, our numeric data, our measure is the count on here. Um, in terms of dimensions, category field, categorical fields, you set the granularity or the level of detail for the view. Um, and these are going to be our blue pills. Likewise, the green and blue pills can both be continuous, discrete, or discrete. However, continuous tends to be green, discrete needs to be blue. Um, and so continuous, as you can imagine, they're just numbers that go on, and discrete is a very specific separate value. 
Um, we are, for this particular uh, visualization, we're using continuous pills because um, of the, the, the values that counts are anywhere in a range from one to how, whatever the total is, I think it's 61,000 for that. The video also is helpful in terms of doing this nice um, comparison. We have continuous and discrete on the left. We have dimension and measure on the top. This is using data overlaid onto a map of the world. Um, it's a little bit small, but so in our first uh, image up here, there's dots across all the different countries. They're all the same color um, because of the way the continuous works. In discrete, the dots are there as well, but you can see from here, they're all different colors. Um, with, the, uh, oops. with the measure then, we're just filling in the country themselves, all within um, a range of colors. Because uh, re uh, remember the continuous is a range. And so some of the, whatever numbers are coming from here, um, the United States clearly has higher number because those are darker. And then um, China, India, Australia, slightly different colored um, as well. Or we can have the discrete that does all of the different colors. And there's this wonderful little table over here that's saying what everything means. So clearly how you're building this you need to take into account what is useful and what is not useful for your particular situation. But um, you, this PDF, like I said, is in the Google Drive folder. You can completely ignore it if you want. I do encourage you to go and watch the video. Um, you don't have to be, a, I don't believe you need to be a Tableau member, um, but you do have to provide your information for it. So that uh, take that into account as well. If you also just uh, Google Tableau pill types um, or use your favorite search engine, uh, you'll be able to get a lot of the community resourcing stuff that explains that as well. All right. Back to our workbook. Um, the one thing I'm going to do, since we're connected to a da data source, I'm going to save it really quick. And I don't want to save it as the same one I have. So just save that in case my computer crashes, we're not gonna actually lose anything. Um, uh, all right, I've been talking for 25 minutes and you're like, Nathan, when are you gonna actually show us any of the data? So here we go. Um, what I wanna do is I want to create a table. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the count pill and I'm gonna drag it to the text marks. So this marks column or uh, card that is on here allows you to do a bunch of different things. Um, color, size, text. We're going to go into a little bit of this as we're actually working at it. And so what it's done now is it's taken a sum of the count of all of the different things that are in it because I haven't divvied up the data in any way. I haven't added any specificity or things like that. And so it's just giving me a grand total of 61,963. This is really small. This is the default. We're going to change that um, when we get into one of the later sheets. Uh, but for right now, we're going to leave that there. As I said, we're going to make a table. And so I actually want this to be relatively useful for us. And so I'm going to drag the format and I'm going to put the rows in the rows thing. And you can see now that I have um, that format column, common materials, audiobooks, books, computer files, images, journals, and I have the accounts associated with them. Uh, we are going to be looking at subformat. So I also now want to take the subformat pill and I want to drag it right back onto the rows as well. And it gives me a really nice table. It does some auto formatting. So instead of saying books seven or eight times, it just gives me the one category for books and we um, can go from there. Um, there are some fancy things you can do in terms of collapsing um, and these various things that will, that'll be a different session or anything like that. But basically here is the table that you can use to kind of, again, validate your data and see everything that you're working with um, for this. Uh, like Office, to bring in that analogy again, um, there's like 15 ways to do every single action. And so let me just uh, back up a second, bring up a new sheet. Um, if I count, double clicked on the count pill, it's gonna kind of do some things automatically for me. Um, and what it did is it created a bar chart with the total number, um, with the 61,000. And if I hover over it, I can see that number. And you'll notice that it took the count and automatically put it in the rows. 
if I just start double clicking on things, so now I double clicked on format and subformat, it's trying to kind of figure out what I want to do. And in some cases, this actually might be useful. Um, this is a nice visualization uh, in terms of very quickly seeing that the print and thesis counts are much, much higher than most of the other counts that are on there, or all the other counts. And the way that it's organized it, we have the audiobooks, books, things on top, and then we have the subformat down at the bottom. Um, I try not to use this too much, but I just kind of find myself into it every once in a while. Over in the upper right-hand corner is the show me, um, the show me button. So when you click on this, this kind of gives you a million different, sorry, hyperbole. It gives you several different uh, ways of organizing your data. And if I really wanted just the table after I put all this together, I can click on the table eye contact, eye, eye content, and it'll make one for me. Now, this still isn't quite right because it's it has put subformat in the columns and I can very easily just drag this down and we'll get the table that we looked at before. But if you wanted to see different kinds of um, uh, bar graphs that were available, so what this is doing is it's taking the format and then just putting the subformat underneath it um, as well uh, for that so we can see that sort of situation. Um, I'm going to talk about pie charts at the end, uh, but we have different pie charts for all these different things. Um, but you can see, you know, depending on the visualization that you're looking at, you can kind of see the information that's going on um, in here. Now, as I'm playing around with this, you'll notice that uh, uh, I also just kind of like took some stuff off. Um, if you ever want, you can always just move around things um, as well or drag them off off the, the sheet itself to get rid of it altogether. Okay. So I'm gonna delete that sheet. And I'm gonna look at our table again. Now, one of the things that I wanted to do uh, was to make this somewhat interactive. And the way that we're gonna do this is by adding a parameter to our um, workbook so that we can uh, show specific pieces of information for this. And so over here in this data column, I'm gonna right click, create parameter. And a parameter is gonna give me a way to kind of provide some interaction uh, and allow a user or even myself to, a data analyst to uh, select the data in the, for, in the ways that they want to be able to do that. So I wanted to create a format selection parameter. So I'm just putting a name. The name really doesn't matter. You can put whatever you want. Um, so this is going to be format selection. The data type is going to be string because we know that um, uh, we know that uh, we do want this for string. Uh, all the formats like cassette, CD, LP, all that sort of stuff are strings. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm looking at Athena's, Athena's note. I miss it too, but thank you, quick sheet one. How do I create a parameter? Okay, okay, so these are all good questions. Um, uh, let me recreate the sheet really quickly. Um, so we've connected the data source. I've collected, I'm not on sheet two, but I basically connect, I, I've clicked, I'm, I've opened a blank sheet. Um, I'm going to take the count, I'm going to drag it to text, and that's going to give me the number up there uh, in my sheet. And then I'm going to take format, and I'm going to drag that to the rows, and I'm going to take subformat, and I'm going to drag that to the rows. Now, to create the parameter, and I see there's a uh, drop down next to the search. Um, in the worksheet, there's an analyst. This is one of those things where there's a million different ways to deal with this, but um, uh, my, my, the way that I tend to handle this is that in the data tab on the left, I right click, create calculated field as first, create parameter as second. I'm going to click create parameter, and then I'm going to type format selection. And this is going to allow me to create uh, a list 
or add a parameter that will allow me to select the format. I want the data type to be string, which makes sense because our formats are all um, characterized as text. Don't worry about the current value um, right now. Now, I do want this to auto-populate. I don't want to have to put retype everything that's in there. So if I click list, I will get a drop-down options that are here. And then I want to, I'm going to base this. I can do fixed, um, which for this data set would probably be fine. But I want it to refresh every time the workbook opens so that if I were to have, if I added a new format or if my parameter was based on some other um, dimension, I would, uh, it would automatically repopulate. So when the workbook opens, I'm going to collect select format. Um, you can see I automatically have the string values, um, category, format, and subformat. It doesn't give me count because that's an integer. Um, but so when workbook opens, select format, and that'll automatically populate um, my values. Now, one of the things that's uh, useful for this is that you have a value that's in your data. And if you wanted it to display differently, you have a value that could be um, uh, written as well. And that, that's you're going to actually do from the fixed. Um, now, what it's done up here at the top is that it's added my current, va uh, current value as archival materials. That's because it's the very first one in the list. If I wanted to change this, say, to books, um, then uh, I could do that too, because maybe books is more interesting uh, for that. OK, so the, the things I touched, I added the name, I added a data type. I, when the workbook opens, I chose the format column, I populated my list of values, and then I added the current value as books. And I'm going to click OK. In the lower left-hand corner now, I have parameters. So I have the tables up here, and I have the parameters down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, I, with my mouse, I can drag. It always puts, it defaults to everything way down here, and that bothers me. So I just kind of drag it up, make it more exciting. Um, when I right-click, I can show parameter. And lo and behold, on the over on the right-hand side, I have my format selection. Uh, and it's populated by books. Um, because that's what I told the current value should be. So then I'm like, let's see what images are. Well, that didn't do anything. Music scores, nope. So the parameter is here, but it is not connected to the visual visualization yet. So as I'm changing the format selection, nothing is happening in my table. When really, if I have a format selection of books, I should only show books. Well, I need to create a calculation now for this and allow the table to filter um, based on my parameter format selector. So this time over in the data area on the left, I'm going to right click, create calculated field. This is going to put up, bring up a box that allows me to create a calculation for this. Um, a lot of the calculations work like Excel. You can actually throw some um, scripting language in here. This, the calculations can get extremely um, technical and robust if needed. This one's going to be pretty simple. Um, now, in this one, table selection, I put a C period in there just so that I instantly see that this is a calculation. It'll also sort all the calculations in it. It's not needed for Tableau. It's just a, a, a device that I use in terms of connection. Some people will do P period for the parameters, um, but I, I tend just to use this for the calculations. And what I want to do is I want my format. So from my table, my format category up here, so that's format. I want it to equal my uh, parameter. OK, so what did I do? I took the format, which uh, showed up in orange and has brackets around it. And it's from the table category up here. I can actually drag and drop if I wanted to as well. Um, but I took my format, and I want it to be equal to format selection. And the parameter then is in purple. My calculation is valid, which is always important. And then I can click OK. So really quickly, I right clicked on data. 
I did create calculated field. I put format equals my parameter. And then uh, I put the name in there and I clicked OK. Now that I have this calculation up here, um, I can add this to my filter and then that'll cause the format selection parameter to work. You'll notice that I have an equal sign in front of a TF or true false. This is going to work as a Boolean. Basically, if books show books, don't show anything else. So I'm going to take my table selection and I'm going to transfer it to filters, drag it over onto filters and let it drop. I have a box that shows up and I want the condition to be true. So when the format selection equals books, then format should equal books. And I click OK. And now my table, my parameter works. You'll notice that I'm only showing books up here. If I choose a different category, um, say maps, then it is only showing the map data. So I'm going to take the filters out again really quickly just to show you. Here's my full table. Table selection into filters. True, because I if it says books, I want it to say books. And then I'm going to click OK. And that now changed my title to what's ever over here on the format selection. This The parameter is probably the most complicated thing we're going to do right now. Um, but it adds a ton of interactivity uh, into your um, into your uh, data set. Um, one last thing that I want to do is I just want to name this tab so we know what we're talking about. Um, so I'm just double clicking down the tab at the bottom, just like you would with Excel, and I'm just going to call this format table. And I can delete this one. All right. Um, what if there's no true option in the filter menu? I've had that happen to me before. If there's no true option in the filter memory, uh, and I basically had to go back and recreate, recreate it. I'm not, I don't know Tableau well enough to know if that, why that happens, um, uh, but I've totally run into it. So I, I will need to go around Elizabeth and look for a better answer for that um, than I gave you. Now, I want to highlight some big data points because I think, as a lot of us know, the table is really good for the practitioners, maybe our administrative team, things like that. They really just want what's the high level big stories. So I want to create um, a tab down here that shows the original records. So I've changed the tab name to original records, it populated it up here. Um, this is the grand total of operation uh, of original records. So this is going to be super easy. I'm just going to take my count and I'm going to put it on text. And as we saw before, 61,000 or 62,000 is the total number of original records for here. And um, this is wonderful. Now, formatting on this is not very useful. And so I think as you play around with Tableau, you'll start seeing easy ways to be able to format at the beginning. So you don't have to do it 100 times per sheet because the formatting on this sheet that we're gonna do doesn't actually apply to other, unless we duplicate the tab. That'll make sense in a second. What I wanna do is I wanna make this number um, larger and more readable so that when we add it to the visualization, it all works out. So on text, if I just, I'm not dragging any pills or anything like that, but in the marks card on text, when I click on it, I get some options, okay? So uh, I got a sum count and I got a dot, dot, dot next to it. I'm gonna click that. This shows me exactly what I'm gonna put into this. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is total original records. Um, this will create the format that's nicer than just using the title at the top. Um, and then I really want the sum count to, uh, to show. So I'm going to make it bold and I'm going to bring it up to a 24 point font. So this is just like your word editor, anything like that. Um, the one last thing I am going to do, I'm going to change the color of this. Uh, and a lot of universities, I think you'll know, have style guides. And so I went and found the Case Western style guide. This is their blue. I looked black, didn't I? 
Let me add their colors. Here it is. This is going to be. This is going to show that in blue. Uh, their specified blue, and then I want to specify their gray as well. Okay. So now what that's done is it's, it's made the number bigger and we've got total original records. There's still some odd formatting things. Um, so I just want to center this really quickly. I've done this by going under alignment, center and center. Again, click the text and did alignment. The last thing I want to do is get rid of the title up here so it's not showing. I don't want to delete it because I want it to stay down here in the tab, but I'm going to right click um, title, un unclick that basically, and now it's just going to show me 61,000 total original records. Now the next two tabs, I'm going to build a little bit on the fast side, um, but it, you can do it the exact same way. Now what's nice about Tableau then is if I, under the original records tab at the bottom, if I right click, duplicate, I've now duplicated this here, which kept all of my formatting. What I want to do is put one for electronic resources count and one for physical resources count. So I, that's in the category pill. So I'm gonna select the category pill, drag it to filters. And then for this one, I will do e-resources first. So I'm gonna collect e-resources, click apply. And okay. This changed my number, but it didn't change my text down here. So I'm going to go back to text, click on the double dots, and change my wording down here so that it says original e resources records. E resources records. So now that's telling me uh, e-resources records, which is correct. And then I want to change my name down here so I don't get confused down the road to e-resources. Now, that was really fast. I'm going to do it one more time for print resources. I'm going to right click the tab at the bottom. I'm going to click duplicate. It's going to duplicate original resources. I'm going to change this to original physical resources. And because I already have the filter up here, um, I'm just gonna double click the filter. It'll bring me back in the options and I'm gonna change to physical resource. So I'm gonna check physical and unchecked electronic. If I click apply while the box is still open, the note will change and we'll go from there. Now we have these numbers, but they're for the entire subset. It's not tied to any of the formats. So I'm going to go back to format table, which is the first uh, sheet we created. So I'm back on format table. Under the filters, you see our parameter selection that is up there at the top. I'm going to right click this and I'm going to apply it to worksheets. So I'm going to click apply to worksheets and I'm going to select the research re, uh, worksheets that I'm going to go for. So again, right click on the filter apply to worksheets, selected worksheets, and I'm going to select the other three worksheets that we have. In this case, it happens to be all of them. I tend to do this because I often don't want it to apply to the whole thing, but um, uh, you get the same result. So now when I click OK, notice we have audiobooks here, um, and these are actually all listed as physical. So if I go over to the original e-resources tab, it's blank. And if I go to original resources, I get 78, which will also be um, the same on my original tab. Now, I don't have a uh, parameter over here. I can easily add that. Um, so on the far left side, parameters, left click, right click rather, um, show parameter. And now my parameter is showing and I can get the different numbers up here if I wanted to see books. Um, I get that here. Now the parameter, again, because we applied it to all the worksheets, even though I don't have the parameter showing over here, this is still applied to books. Um, but I can show the parameter and we'll see that it's books. Cool.
Whew, this is quite the whirlwind. Um, thank goodness it's being recorded. Now, the last thing I wanted to do was to actually build the visualization for this. So we're basically gonna take all the pieces that we just built, the four sheets, add some text to it and create this dashboard. Um, and so at the bottom of our uh, Tableau workbook, we have the kind of the one plus square with some writing in it, that's a new worksheet. The one over next to it is a new dashboard. So down at the bottom, this is the middle, little tiny little tab. If you hover on it, it says new dashboard. The one on the right says new story. We're not gonna worry about that today. Um, but new dashboard, I'm gonna click in this and it's gonna give you a different kind of view. What this view does is basically it's the canvas that we're going to paint our, uh, our, our, our visualization on. Um, you can do tons of different layouts. Um, there's a bunch of preset layouts in here as well. Um, so I'm under size and uh, you can pick desktop, full screen, small blog, column, blah, 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 PowerPoint. That's the one I tend to use a lot. Um, because I've, I've built something like this before already, I'm just going to put this at 900 pixels by 300 pixels. And then I'll kind of space everything out in a nice way. Um, for this, and I may adjust this uh, eventually, but um, we're good for now. Uh, the very first thing I want to do is add a title. So we have a bunch of different objects down here in the lower left-hand column. Um, we have the options that these different objects are tiled, which means they're gonna kind of work together like a block set and kind of stick to each other, or floating where you can kind of drag them wherever you want. Um, for most cases right now, we want this to be tiled. I want to take a text object. So I'm left clicking on this and holding it down and I'm going to drag it over to our worksheet and I'm going to drop it on the bottom. It's going to ask me, what do I want my text to be? I'm going to say case Western reserve original cataloging. And I want this to be interactive and I want it to show the format that I'm going to be using. So, I can do this by clicking insert and clicking parameters format selection. So what this is going to do is list whatever I put in the parameter at the very top with the top, basically this is the title of the, of the, um, the visualization. So when I click that, it kind of has this uh, bracket, carrots, uh, parameters format selection, and this will dynamically change as the parameter changes. Now, because this is a title, I want to make these larger. So I'm going to make them 24. Uh, and I want my parameter selection to be that case Western blue. And this guy up here to be that gray. I'm also going to bold, bold that just to kind of highlight it out. Cool. So I, I clicked OK from that box, and then it populated. Um, right now, it's my whole canvas because there aren't any other objects there to kind of play around with it. Um, so uh, it's that's why it's filling up the whole thing. What I want to do now is I want to fill my sheets on this. And so I want to take, um, I want to highlight the original cataloging that was done first. So my sheets are all over here on the left. If you um, click on it and drag it over. I want to put it underneath the title. So you can see the shading right now, how it's done half of it. If I play around with this, I can actually put it like this would be on the top, this would be the left, this would be the right. Um, I totally did that backwards. This is the left, this is the right. And um, here's the bottom. So I want to put it at the bottom. So that's going to just put this in there for now. And it also added um, the parameter box up here. And it did this by kind of moving everything over. Well, I don't really like that because we're going to end up with some dead space over here. So the little tiny, what I've done is I've selected kind of the fence that is around the format selector. There's a little arrow for more options. I'm going to click that and I'm going to change this to floating. So remember the tiled was where all the bricks kind of automatically snap together. And the floating is I can put it wherever I want. 
So I click floating. This is now um, basically made it its own little thing. I am going to leave it up here in this corner, um, but it's no longer dictating the left hand side of the box. Um, I'm going to do the next things in a specific order just to make it format a little bit easier. Um, uh, ultimately, you can just throw things on here as you want and um, uh, uh, play around with the formatting of the things as well. But I'm going to take the table next and I'm going to drag that and put that onto the left of the original records. Um, I do have the option of doing the whole left hand side, right hand side, I'm doing it again, the whole right hand side. I'm not going to do that. I just want it to be on the right of the original records. There's my table. And then I'm going to take the uh, original, let's do physical first, the physical resources and drag that um, to the left now of the original records. So in between the original records and format table. And I'm going to take the original e resources. And I want that to be next to the original resources. But the way that I have it, you see the shaded area is all on the top or is all over the formatted table. So what that did was it created four equal boxes. If I didn't do that, it was going to divide things up and then have to drop and drag. And I, I didn't really want to do that. Um, now, because I added the text here, the bottom of all these, I don't actually need the title for any of it. Um, so if I right click, hide title, it's going to move the title and it's going to bring that text up and really fill in the real estate better. Um, I also then want to fit entire view so that it's centered. So what did I do? On the original res physical resources box, I clicked the box. I'm going to do the little arrow for more options on the right hand side. I'm going to remove the title. And then I'm going to click that little uh, arrow again. And I'm going to say fit entire view. I'm going to do it one more time. Actually, I'm going to do it two more times. So remove the title, fit entire view, and I'm going to remove the title, and I'm going to fit entire view. Now, this is kind of squished in here, so I'm actually going to drag this line up a little bit um, so that we get the table a little bit formatted better. Books is our largest table with subformats. So um, we're not going to worry about, uh, or, or I want to make sure that this will fit. Um, a couple more things I want to do under format. Is that where it is? Yeah, OK. So under format, I want to click Remove. Um, this isn't going to remove it from the data. It's going to remove it from the visualization. I say it's books up here. The format selection says books. I don't need it to say books for this particular category. Um, uh, and so I just remove that so it's a little bit nicer to see. Um, I could sort these alphabetically if I wanted. I can also sort these um, by numbers if I wanted to see like what is at the top. And this will apply regardless of what format selection we're having. And you can see the journals up here is changing as well. One last thing to add to the visualization, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, always cite your sources. Uh, I'm going to add a text bottom down here uh, so that it does the entire line. This particular data is from OCLC. So I'm going to say that this is WorldCat OCLC. And I'm going to acknowledge that it's January 2022. Now, this will kind of just smash everything together. No worries. Um, find the line up here, drag it down so it's at the very bottom. But always, you always want to cite your sources. Um, and so, in a nutshell, this is now the visualization. And if you were to put this, um, in Tableau Online, or you had a, a website or something, a server that you could put this on, your any administrator or anybody who wanted to know how many original ebooks did we do um, for all time, you know, you can very easily get this. You can add dates to this. So if you wanted to see what was the quarter, you can add calculations to do. This is the current quarter. This is what we did last quarter. You can get extremely robust with this. Um, 
uh, as you can imagine. But like I said, I wanted to kind of keep this simple. And this was quite enough to get into in just the hour as it was anyway. Um, so I absolutely acknowledge that that was a whirlwind tour of this. Um, hopefully the video, if you do go back to this, will kind of help you work into it. I also highly encourage just playing around and seeing what different things are in there. And if you run into, if you get stuck, you know, doing a, a, a search on different communities and, and to see what um, is out there, because a lot of these answers are out there and it'll show you uh, exactly what you need to do. So to wrap up, um, I just want to sh uh, share a couple different um, experiences for this. So, so tips from visualizations. The key here is really telling the story. What do you want to tell with the data? And uh, attached to that, what do you, what is your audience? Who is your audience? Are these um, the dean of your library, the director of your library, who is really interested in the big picture and the big numbers? Or is this the acquisition specialist that wants to know the number of dollars spent on an ebook in last month or last week, things like that? Um, you do need to be honest with the data. One of the books that I'm going to recommend talks about um, how really easy it is to manipulate the data to tell the story you want it to tell. So make sure you are telling the story of the data and not what you want the data to tell, and then of course, have fun. Um, additional considerations, of course, we have data quality, accuracy, correctness. Again, be honest with your data. Um, there's quite a bit of stuff you can do with data cleanup and prep to make the visualization easier to put together. And it's also worth noting simple is often best. Two more slides. Uh, this is just a list of links for things um, that you can use in terms of resources. We have, um, for some reason, my, uh, what's this called? Zoom, Zoom bar won't shut. But anyway, we have um, the analytics uh, Tableau user group. This is uh, a user group that meets once a month and they have excellent program. It's two hours every month, different time zones. So it meets people over the world. And so there's usually one time zone that is like three in the morning for us. Um, but they have people who come in and talk about best practices, visualizations they brought together, extremely useful. Um, if you're interested in reading up on things, we have the Tableau blog, um, a, a group that I'm interested in, Playfair Data, they offer um, training, you do have to pay for it, but they also write a blog, have some tips on it as well. And then you have the Flolage twins who also do that, um, different things uh, in case you're interested in just reading up. Um, Googling or searching the internet is also extremely useful. I've provided links here. Um, there's a list of some books that I have in case you're interested in it. Um, not all of these are specific to Tableau. Data literacy is just um, about data literacy in libraries, but of course it touches on visualization. Um, the, the two here, Stephen Few, uh, show me the numbers, you know, just how different, uh, lots of different visualizations to look from. Big data, big dupe. This is the one that's kind of like, don't go telling the story you want to tell, tell the story the data tells. Um, and then Ryan Sleeper, who works at uh, Playfair Data, um, he has practical Tableau, which is nice to have kind of at your fingertips if you just want to mention through. And finally, I, I can't, I don't like pie charts. Um, my classes and all that sort of stuff really taught me to hate pie charts. And so this is the only valid use of a pie chart. We have the sky, we have the sunny side of the pyramid and the shady side of the pyramid. In most cases, you can tell a better story with bar graphs than pie charts. Um, you'll find a lot of data viz people say, don't use pie charts or donut charts. It's a uh, ugly cousin. Um, but uh, remember you do you, you're the one telling the story. And with that, after our whirlwind tour, I am done. Are there any questions for Nate? <clears throat> I put a question in. <laughs> I was wondering if you're allowing end users to use the dashboard um, to make their own selection for the format so that they can um, take a look at the different formats if they only have one area of responsibility. Yeah, so, so I, ideally, wherever this ends up published, um, either on the Tableau server or Tableau online, whoever is using your data 
um, would be able to do the format selection. And if you had like date ranges or other things in there, they would be able to set all of that criteria. Um, Tableau gets pretty sophisticated also with like drilling down. So where if you start at a top level and maybe um, want to drill down different layers, there's quite a bit of functionality that Tableau allows um, you to do. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I should also mention what might be useful for a lot of people is you can export um, you can export the things as images. Let me bring my um, screen back up. Now, when you export, you lose that you lose the interactivity. Um, but if you if you wanted just to have the this particular image here, if you go under dashboard and export as image. Uh, I'm just doing a download. Um, it'll export this as an image, and then you can add this to PowerPoint slides or or different things like that. Um, see, and now this is static. I can't do anything with it, but at least now I have this visualization. If, if you've been watching cataloging meetings at OCLC, you'll kind of see this kind of formatting because we'll do a lot of our stats and just do images that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, David Green asked if you know of any organizations in Ohio that are focused on library analytics. I'm not familiar with library analytics um, at the moment, although uh, there'd be something, it's totally something to build. I know that they're, so the analytics user group that I mentioned is kind of for anyone using Tableau. There's a Columbus Tableau users group um, that meets uh, every once in a while. And so there's a lot of those. If you go to that, if you start with the analytics user group and then just find the general user group page, you will find a lot of different user groups that are out there for different communities. Um, yeah. Sounds great. Well, thank you for that presentation. I learned a little bit about pills. <laughs> I know that's the hardest thing for it's me hard. too. It's hard to understand, and and I found the only way I get around in it is to play with it. Yeah. And you know, you're not going to break anything, so you might yeah. as well just try it out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I guess what we're going to do at this point in time is take a 15 minute break, and then return with Stephanie Church from Case Western Reserve University. Um, and, you know, depending on how things go, we'll have an extended uh, lunch break after Stephanie's presentation and come back at 1.30 for our business meeting. But right now we're going to take a 15 minute break. And I want to remind you, too, that we're asking for your help with the evaluation form, which I think the link was already put into the chat box. Um, it's anonymous unless you choose not to. And it helps us structure the future meetings. It helps us do a little better in the planning and presenting. And if you have any other good ideas of what you would like to see, NOTSA wants to make this you know, your group. Um, so also put that in, you know, any ideas you have for future meetings. We appreciate it. And any speakers that you might want to see. So we'll break for 15 and then come back with Stephanie Church. Thank you. Hi, welcome back. Um, for some reason, I can't get my audio to start, so I'm hoping that my voice is coming over. Um, <clears throat> so our second Tableau demonstration is Tableau in Action, Enhancing Discovery and Complementing Decision Making, presented by Stephanie Church. Stephanie Church has been with Case Western Reserve University for over 13 years as an acquisition librarian. Her areas of responsibility include monograph purchases, managing and implementing user-driven initiatives, and collection assessment. I'm excited to see how she's going to apply um, Tableau with Counter and Sierra data to create meaningful dashboards. And now here is Stephanie Church. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, thank you everybody for joining me this morning. Um, I also would like to say a really quick thank you to Natsal as well for inviting me to speak today. Um, yes, I'm really excited to show you some of the things that 
I've been doing with Tableau. Um, and I, I definitely want to give a shout out to Nathan. Um, that presentation was wonderful. And I, I had some really great takeaways of things that I'm excited to apply um, as well. I think I learned, I learned some things today too. So thank you for that. So um, I am at uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, for anyone who might not be familiar, it is located in Cleveland, Ohio. We are a private research institution with roughly 11,000 students. And most of those students are at the graduate and professional level. Um, in all, CWRU has four campus libraries and where I'm located is at the uh, Calvin Smith Library. So um, now that you know a little bit about me, I'd like to dive right into Tableau. Um, I think Nathan did a, a really great job showing the connections and how you can connect to uh, Excel data. And he also touched on the fact that you can connect to servers as well. So something I'm really excited to just kind of quickly walk through. Um, and then again, feel free to use this video as reference or the PowerPoint as well, but you can connect directly to Sierra. And now I, I know that this uh, meeting today has a wide audience, so um, apologies if you are not an innovative library, but chances are your ILS may, may connect to Tableau as well. So definitely talk to your system, system administrator. So this uh, particular slide just kind of shows some of the steps to make that connection. So this would be a really great reference uh, in the PowerPoint or with the video. But Sierra has a uh, Postgres database in its back end, and that's what Tableau is connecting to. Uh, so while I have the steps here, I do have some screenshots that I'll just kind of work through real quickly to show you how exactly to do that. So uh, Nathan showed exactly how you connect to Excel. So that home screen for Tableau is where you will want to go to connect to Sierra. Um, and what you'll see here is uh, this PostgreSQL is where you will connect to Sierra. And when you click on that, um, you will see this dialog box appear. Uh, so what you're gonna wanna do is have your server address. You will put your port number. The database is triple I. I'm guessing if you're uh, also an innovative customer that that's exactly what you use as well. Uh, and then you use your Sierra or, or um, innovative ID and your user password to authenticate. So one thing I will mention is I know I had to talk to our system administrator to make sure on the back end that my um, user ID also allowed me to tap into this information. So I think that is something that would need to be turned on in order to query the system. And uh, do not worry if you're running uh, searches or, or using Tableau, um, it does not affect Sierra at all. So there's no worry of um, causing any problems or deleting anything by accident. It's a, it's a safe playground within Tableau. So once you're able to authenticate, this is what it will look like in um, Tableau, what you'll see. So on the left-hand side, you end up seeing a, a ton of tables and Sierra has lots and lots of tables on the back end. Um, Sierra also has something called uh, Sierra DNA, which really is a, a really great reference tool. And it will go into detail and tell you what's in every one of these tables. It'll let you know all the fields that are included um, and also, help with any kind of connections or match points when you start to build or add additional tables within Sierra. So for this specific one that you're looking at here, this is looking at bib record data. Um, and I believe it's, it's some of the fixed fields in the uh, header. Something else I do wanna uh, mention when you're working with this is that right here you'll see uh, Sierra view and you'll wanna make sure that as you drag tables um, from, that are available to you. You want to make sure you have something that says Sierra View because that's what's going to populate in Tableau for you. So taking this particular um, table one step further, uh, something I also want to mention is that not only can you connect to Sierra, but then you can also add Excel files as well. So in this specific case, 
what I did was I have that bib record table and I joined a Excel file that essentially is um, countries. So while the country code is in our bib record data, uh, Tableau can't make sense of the, the, or the mark codes that we know. So what I did was create a key essentially because Tableau does understand um, countries. In fact, uh, let's see if I can quickly send something in the chat for you. This is a visualization on the Tableau, my Tableau public uh, profile that uses this in action. So feel free to check that or uh, play around with that. So that's how you connect Sierra and Tableau. Um, so I'm going to show you something that I ended up creating from that. And what we were really interested in was looking at print circulation data. So I think one of our questions really when we were thinking about how can we start to look at some of the information in Sierra because there's so much. And I, I really feel like sometimes I'm just scratching the surface, but we were really interested in, you know, what physical materials are our users checking out? What, what, is, um, what are our researchers interested in? And I do have a dashboard that I can uh, send to you guys so you can play around with it. And I will pull it up as well and just kind of talk through what I have here. So again, this information is on Tableau Public and similar to um, what Nathan mentioned, you know, there's, there's no um, identifying information or sensitive data. So I felt comfortable putting this on Tableau Public, public but uh, Case Western Reserve is actually a we have made Tableau our preferred visualization tool. So because of that, we do have Tableau server. So in some of these cases, I will show you some things that aren't, aren't necessarily too sensitive, but they are on our Tableau server. And one really great benefit of Tableau server is that it will automatically update for me. So the link and the visualization that I sent out, which I'll pull up here, uh, this the visualization the the data behind it is static so it won't be up to date however on our server it it updates every day so we can see the new transactions that are are being um, made downstairs so what you see here is our print circulation since 2018 so there are itemized transactions that sierra captures and that's exactly what we're looking at and i believe it's the circ history um, table. And if anyone is interested in, in some of that back end information of how I made the connections, by all means, I would love, feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to show you some of the connections I made in order to do this. Um, so what you'll see here first is the checkout trends by date. And what's awesome about Tableau and, and Nathan kind of showed is the fact that everything is dynamic here. So we can click on a specific year, calendar year, if you're interested, um, or you can even click on a range by selecting, dragging and selecting uh, various dates. Um, so also what I did, which uh, connects another Excel document is subject breakdown. I think it's interesting to see the title list, but, but having that subject information just makes it a little bit more valuable information for us to uh, analyze and look at. So you can see here that over the past few years, these are the subclasses that have been the most popular at our library. Um, these are also dynamic as well. So if you were interested in music literature, you can see the breakdown change by year. And then also our title list over here on the right will repopulate for us. So you can see what were the most popular physical titles in our collection that were checked out the most by our users. Um, in fact, just anecdotally, our music librarian was really excited about this, and she had even shared with me that she sent this, or she had mentioned this when meeting with music graduate students to, to highlight that our collection, out of all the different classes and subclasses, that, that music, it really is one of the more popular um, subjects for physical checkouts. So th this is something I wanted to show you that was created with Sierra and Tableau. Um, something I will mention is I, I think when we create these, I know Nathan was talking about storytelling. And I think 
when I when I'm putting these together, I'm always very much aware that I'm telling just a small portion of the story with the data. But really, when I, I bring it to my colleagues and they're able to supplement like the, my subject librarians like JC, who can share information or they, they often our subject librarians will look at this and have really great insights that I would never have any idea uh, about. But it really it's just a really great springboard to conversations and often additional questions as well. So I'm gonna pull up uh, this. I have in our um, PowerPoint some of the discoveries. Uh, I know I kind of highlighted them as we talked through that, but you know, one discovery was that M's, the M uh, LC class has the most checkouts. Another discovery was looking at the years, we could see how the pandemic really affected circulation. I think we kind of know, but this gives us exact figures. Um, and just the, another discovery of being able to see those actual titles that were being checked out. Um, something else I wanted to mention too, let's see if I can pull that up really quick, that we thought was fascinating was looking at the year of publication. You know, when you kind of start to scroll through, it's not necessarily the most recent content that's being checked out. It really shows the value of our historical collection and that people are interested in not just the most recent uh, title that we have. Great. Um, I'm sorry I can't see the chat, so I'm sorry if there's any questions, but by all means put them through and then I'm happy to answer anything at the end. But next up, I'd like to talk about uh, access denied counter reports. Um, the first visualization I'll show you is within our Tableau server, um, but the next one I show you'll be able to play around with. So I think we were really, uh, I, I should pull up my, sorry, I'll pull up my PowerPoint. I'm trying to do too many things at once. Um, so our question I think really was, oh, this is for the e-journal, my mistake. Um, okay, let me go back. For the ebook information, what I was interested in was just taking that, our counter reports and compiling them and to see what we would be able to see from them. I think what's really cool about Tableau and what has me thinking often is like, what are those, what are those bigger trends that we can look at when we compile information? So for this particular um, ebook dashboard, I just wanted to compile turnaways from the last two years. So uh, this is uh, dynamic as well. You can look at either 2020 or 2021 and it will populate because of that. But again, this is something I shared with our subject librarians and our administration as well. So at the top, similar to kind of what Nathan put together, you have some of the higher level information. It shows you how many uh, access denials we had within a given fiscal year. You can see how many titles that uh, relates to. So nearly 6,000 titles had nearly 18,000 turnaways. Um, this information really is an estimate and it, not necessarily realistic but it kind of gives administration an idea of what it would cost the library to purchase all those titles. And like I said, it, this isn't a realistic number, but it is interesting to think how much content our users are not able to access at their point of need. Um, so then I started kind of thinking about this a little bit more like a uh, data analyst. So yes, it's not, it's definitely not realistic for us to buy 6,000 eBooks but it might be realistic to buy 100. So let's look at those top 100 titles that were that our users received a access denial. Uh, and that accounted for a little over 6,000 turnaways. So if we were able to uh, put an investment in some of those titles, it could really make a big difference. So to show some of this interactivity, um, you can click on one of the, or, or our users, or excuse me, my colleagues are able to click on a given publisher and look at what those turnaways are. And in this case, I will click on EBSCO. You can see we've got some limit exceeded. So this actually was a, a jumping off point 
for us thinking about uh, EBSCO has the ability for us to turn on um, automatically upgrade titles. So we're, we're having conversations of this, is this something we should consider? And that way it's seamless access for our users. And again, it would help to cut down and reduce some of those turnaways that, that our users are experiencing. Um, I, think, I think those are some of the, the themes we were thinking about when, after in the conversations we had once we put this information together. Um, so then since eBooks are really such a small portion of our collection and where we spend our money, naturally we said, okay, let's, let's check out eBook or excuse me, eJournal turnaways and what, what do those look like? So let me go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint again. So yes, so what can we learn? What, what would we be able to learn as well from eJournal turnaways? And in this case, I do have a dashboard for you to um, play around with again. Stephanie, yes. uh, quest question came through um, before you get too far beyond the topic. Uh, no problem. What, what was your data source for the turnaway reports? Do you have an yes. ERM that connects to reports for you to create a single data source? Or were you able to connect individual reports? Yeah, that's a really great question. So. Um, what I ended up doing is I compiled that myself. So um, if an ERM is able to do that, that would be amazing. That would certainly be incredibly helpful, but I did compile those. Um, Tableau isn't the best at um, understanding a counter report. I know the um, line is usually, I think it's like row 11 or something like that. So I quickly compiled them into a Excel document and worked from there. So is it ideal? Not necessarily, but it, what it gives me in return for me, it's, it's totally worth the, the small time investment to, to compile that. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, and I'm also really excited to hear what uh, Greg, Phil and Scarlett have to say about counter too. So I think one of the things I learned after doing the ebook visualization was, while this is really helpful, what would be even better is if we had subject information. We have a lot of different um, campus libraries, like I had mentioned, or subject librarians who are really interested in the overall trends, but specifically their subject areas. So that is something that I, I did with this particular visualization with the e-journal access denied reports. Um, so as you can see, we have the high level data again of your turnaways by fiscal year. And again, these are dynamic. So I hope you're playing with these and having fun drilling down into the information. But as you click on a given publisher, our information changes here as well. Um, you're probably asking how I got the subject data, um, and I would just like to thank every vendor that I reached out to. I, I, that's exactly what I did, is I gave them two years of counter reports, and I said, can you help me add a primary subject to this information? And the primary, I, I didn't want to get too specific. I felt like this was kind of a, I think it, it was easy for them to pull, but kind of, kind of a, a big ask. So I, I wasn't more specific than a primary subject. So I did need to kind of create, end up creating my own key for the various subjects that we received back. But you can see that now this information becomes that much more valuable. You can click on specific subjects and, and look at where those turnaways are. And again, this was a really great springboard uh, for our subject librarians and our collection strategy groups to start talking about where some of our gaps may lie, or are we subscribing to the best content for our users? And something I think we're, we're thinking of moving on here, because I think, I think we can kind of expand on this, and that, that sometimes is the, the trouble with Tableau. It usually brings up more questions. Um, as you go along, but I think now we're thinking, okay, here's our turnaways. How does that relate to IOL data? Are we seeing titles repeatedly here in the turnaways and also in IOL? And if so, perhaps we need to start considering those either as a swap for things that we're currently subscribing to or supplement a wish list. Let's fill up our wish list with as much as we can 
so that if there were a time where we would have additional funds, we would be ready and we would have the data behind it to support the decisions as to why we're adding specific things. And I, again, this is a, a piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, I don't think our wish list should only have things with lots of turnaways or some turnaways, but it's it's definitely um, a more measured approach towards collection development. So I'll pull up my PowerPoint here. So again, the journal take e-journal takeaways were that macro, the bigger overall picture, as well as really drilling down. We were able to see subject information. Again, thank you to all vendors who offered that. And we can supplement our wish list. So I, I hit all those. Um, I, I have one more visualization that I will share today. Um, and it has to do with Ohio link borrowing trends. So for anyone who might be outside of Ohio joining us today, Ohio link is our um, state consortium. So unfortunately, uh, a few months back, there was a, a stoppage of service with uh, some of the print materials. And at that time, I think we were kind of asking ourselves questions about what our users request from, um, from Ohio Link, and we were wondering, you know, what are going to, what will be the ramifications of this, and what can, what just what could we learn from that in general? And I, I wish I could say that we, this is data that we were capturing prior to these questions, but unfortunately, it just wasn't. Um, so the the data isn't as robust, or doesn't have uh, quite the history that I would like, or that we would have wished to have. Um, but I will share this nonetheless. This is again, something that is on our server. So I, I'm unable to share this, but uh, what we're able to glean from those in-reach reports that we are now keeping and downloading is information such as user type. So you can see our grad student, staff, undergrad, faculty. We actually have it um, segmented out by the, the music uh, faculty, student, staff as well, which is which is interesting. But this data is just for a few months, and it shows the LC breakdown of what are our users requesting. Uh, again, this information is dynamic. So if we were interested in what grad students are requesting, it gives us a breakdown. And so, and uh, something else to think like the data doesn't always tell the exact story or a complete story. You know, maybe we need to consider that some of these requests may be uh, faculty driven as well, but it, it at least gives us an idea of what our researchers are interested in. And you can see right away, our language and literature was one of those areas that um, is being requested the most at, at this point of gathering information. So I was so excited to share this with my colleague, Aaron Smith, who is the liaison for English. And, um, you know, I, I referenced, it's always so interesting to take this data to them, um, as well as um, I, I was able to show them a title list that we have. And she's able to look at that and quickly say, well, you know, what I see here is children's books. And Case Western Reserve, we are pretty heavily STEM focused. You can see by our e-journal turtleways that medical is way up there. So, you know, I, I am sad to say we don't have a, a, a strong children's book collection. But what that tells me is that just shows the value of Ohio Link for our library. These might not necessarily be titles that we would add to our collection. But it also, it was a jumping off point for her too, because Erin realized that, you know, one of her faculty members does teach a children's class. So perhaps it would be worth talking with that faculty member and, and finding out what would be, if you, you had an ideal collection of, you know, say 50 titles, what would you, what would be your dream collection that we would have here that your um, students could, could grab? Or I had other colleagues look through it and they would say, oh, those are, those are textbooks. Or we actually have that book on reserve, but somebody must have wanted it a physical copy. So, you know, we can't necessarily, it's not a one for one, like looking at the title list and say, oh, these are things we absolutely need. Instead, it really takes a, a lot of us working together and thinking through what we're seeing in order to um, think, 
to, to kind of come to the various conclusions. So I will pull up my um, PowerPoint here. Yeah, so we get to see user trends, the popularity, and again, reinforcing the value of being part of a consortium and consortial borrowing. So that is everything that I had for today. I hope um, this was inspiring or informative. I hope that you are also interested in Tableau or playing around with it, but that really was um, everything I wanted to share today. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Are there any questions for Stephanie? I haven't noticed any in the chat, but you know, doing this kind of an analysis it's kind of important for us to give feedback, I think, to the publishers to let them know that, you know, having spreadsheets that are pre-built with all of those subject categories for their journals, I think EBSCO does it. I'm not sure about everybody else. That would be a great jumping point, you know, and then you customize it when you bring it in-house. But yeah, that's, that's a lot. And I learned a lot from you too as well, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, let's see, someone said, do we ever consider or try to apply subjects to ebook data as well? Yes, absolutely. So I haven't, I haven't done it yet. Um, our fiscal year ends in July. So that is my intention to supplement that information in Tableau as well. Um, we are a Coots library, um, and I know one really easy way for me to um, pull data is sometimes to put, throw in ISBNs and export out. So I know that's a way that I could supplement that data so that we could see the subject information as well. Absolutely. And when I, um, I will just kind of go back when I shared that information with our RSLs, our subject librarians, uh, I did that for the top 100. And that's something I, I had in an Excel spreadsheet, because really, that would be the the titles that we could potentially target. But I think like looking at that macro level, again, it would be really important to see what are those subjects or the LC call ranges that are of interest that our users are unable to access um, because of the, you know, not, not having a, a copy in our collection. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you very much for that presentation. Sure. So, um, we're running ahead of schedule, which is kind of nice because you'll have a nice long lunch break. And then we'll come back at 1.30 for our business meeting. Um, I, th I think voting is closed right now, um, but we should be able to um, announce the winners of the new officers after lunch once we reconvene. So um, enjoy lunch and reconvene at 1.30 um, I think we're daylight savings time for anybody outside the Ohio area. Thank you. Um, so this afternoon, it, it, the session is going to consist of a team of three people, three presenters. We're going to have two presenters first. Um, both are from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, we'll start with Greg Edwards, the cataloging and metadata librarian and um, follow quickly with Phil Hewitt, who is the Senior Engineering and Electronic Collections Library. Like I said, both are from Lehigh University. Greg, um, in addition to his regular cataloging duties and maintenance, he has worked with Phil on a workflow to collect, report, and analyze usage statistics as part of the library's renewal and subscription cycle. He also has worked with the open source library platform portfolio <clears throat> or just folio. The second uh, member of that team is Phil Hewitt and he uses a broad understanding of academic library work to produce data informed, holistic and sustainable approaches to building engaging library collections Phil uses data in his work as an instruction and reference librarian to examine assumptions around library collections. Over the last five years, Phil led work to save more than $1 million annually in subscription costs. 
He is excited to explore new ways to use collection funds to support research, teaching, and learning more broadly. So welcome, Greg and Phil. <clears throat> Greg, you should have co-host capabilities to be able to share your Great. screen. Um, I don't see Phil in the room yet. I don't either. I'll send him a quick message. I know I am on first, so I think he's got a little bit of time to pop in, but I will share okay. a quick Slack message too. I well. will. I will watch for him. Okay. Oh, I just admitted Phil, so he should be here. Oh, perfect. Uh, well, I just want to say uh, thank you all, first of all, for having me. Uh, I was really excited to come and talk with you about Counter. So hopefully it's uh, at least a little bit interesting and not too boring. It can get uh, very detailed, but I'll try my best not to put you all to sleep. So um, in just a minute here, I'll get um, started with my slides. But I also wanted just to thank um, Phil Hewitt and Scarlett Galvin for uh, presenting with me today. And I hope that you find this really useful and interesting. So with that, I will get started. Um, and as uh, was mentioned, so Phil and I will be presenting um, each about a half hour, and then uh, I believe there's a short break, and then um, Scarlett will follow up after that. So we will have a combined Q&A session at the end. So um, I'll try to keep an eye on chat if there are any questions during the presentation, but um, otherwise, if you have questions for any one of us in particular, we'll try to get to all of them at the end. So thank you. So let me try the screen share. All right, so without further ado, thank you for uh, again coming and allowing me to present. So uh, we'll be talking about understanding and using counter um, in collection analysis. Uh, and again, I'm Greg Edwards presenting with uh, Phil Hewitt and Scarlett Galvin. So what exactly is counter? Um, if you're like me, you want to know what every acronym stands for. So I uh, had to look this up. Luckily, counter is pretty self-explanatory, um, but it stands for stands for counting online usage of networked electronic resources. So really what it is, is looking at counting the usage of all of those, you know, ebooks, journals, databases, all of those electronic resources that you have in the library. So Project Counter itself is a nonprofit. And um, basically, it's an effort to standardize um, the reporting of these electronic usage statistics. So the idea is that um, there are so many different electronic resources available now in the library that um, it's important from a collection development aspect to think about um, a standard way to look at these, get reliable numbers, and basically understand them so that we can make informed decisions. And Project Counter does this through their code of practice. So this is basically their set of rules, guidelines, and regulations um, that they detail uh, basically what goes into these usage reports, um, what gets counted, um, and what are the rules that all of the different publishers and platforms have to follow in order to um, have a counter compliant um, report that they can then put out to their you know, all the libraries or people that subscribe to them and use them. Uh, and I will make a note that Counter 5 is the current iteration. Um, and that's important because right now there are still some publishers and platforms um, that are only using Counter 4. Uh, I believe Counter 5 came out um, in 2019, um, but it took a little while for a lot of the platforms to switch over or become compliant. So you might see some that say Counter with a little 4 at the end, but most of them should say that 5 now. Um, and there were some differences. I, I won't get into too much um, because that gets pretty specific, but you can find all that information online. Um, and also I will plug here that um, Project Counter has a great website that has uh, a lot of training material and explanations and backgrounds into counter reporting um, and understanding reports and the usage statistics that are included there. Um, so I'm going to do my best during these 30 minutes to um, give a great uh, overview explanation and get into some detail, but um, there's so much information tied to these that uh, I definitely recommend going to the website if you're interested in learning more about counter reporting and really getting into the details there. So who uses counter? Um, it's a great question. And the, the easy answer is most of the big players in the industry. So it is widely recognized and implemented amongst um, a lot of publishers and platforms. And like I said, those big players like your EBSCO, Gale, ProQuest, um, 
the big ones, a lot of the, you know, middle ones, like uh, company biologists, some, uh, and even some of the smaller ones, like um, newspapers online, uh, all offer counter reports. So um, it's, it's so widely recognized that it provides a really good um, starting point when you're thinking about looking at usage of electronic resources. And uh, again, I talked about Project Counter website. They have a great registry of compliance that lists all of the participants there. And that's the image I have here on the right, just you know, the start of the alphabet. So also, if you're getting into usage statistics and you're curious to see if um, the publisher or platform that you're looking at is compliant, you can go to the website and find out there. And then also it'll tell you if they're up to date with counter five or if they're using the older version of counter four. And why use counter? So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, the code of practice um, really lays out all of these rules and guidelines that offers what I like to call the apples to apples way of evaluating usage across different platforms. So, you know, a library is going to have electronic resources from a lot of different publishers, typically, um, you know, public libraries might have fewer just the ones that are provided by like the county or state level, or if you're in an academic library, you know, you could have dozens, hundreds of different um, publisher resources. So how do you look at all of these different platforms and publishers and find commonality in order to really evaluate how they're being used and compare them against each other because that is an important part of collection development and that's what counter lets us do with their code of practice is that it provides consistent standards um, that are applied across the board for any publisher that wants to stay it's counter compliant and it lets you pull a report from you know, an EBSCO database or a SAGE database and um, be reliable that those numbers are going to be able to be compared fairly. Um, and uh, it also provides an element of transparency because you can go to Project Counter and see exactly all, um, what that usage is. You can read all of the documentation. Um, you can go through the handy training courses they have there or um, you know, easily reference the code of practice PDF if you have a question and see exactly what that number represents. And that's really helpful. Um, just a quick note here, um, uh, besides Counter, um, if you've worked at all with usage reports, you might be familiar. A lot of publishers and platforms offer their own sort of custom or in-house usage reports. And who really knows what goes into that? They might tell you or they might not tell you everything. Um, you don't know exactly how they're recording uses and clicks and the way that people are using those electronic resources. So that's where Counter comes in very handy because it's all transparent and recorded. And it's not coming from the publisher that's trying to sell you a product. It's coming from this nonprofit that's looking to standardize the way that these usages are being reported. And um, just talking about, again, why use it beyond this idea of, um, you know, like a third party standardized system. Usage reporting is really powerful tool in collection development. Um, and I'm included just, uh, I know this morning you went through the, the Tableau. So this is not Tableau. This is just my sad little Excel um, graph that I've created. Um, but something we do when we're doing collection analysis is looking at this sort of simple cost per use. Um, so saying like, okay, we paid this much for uh, a bunch of ebooks or a journal package. Um, this is how many times it was used, you know, last year. What's like a simple calculation of sort of how do we evaluate this with the cost per use? So this is the kind of thing that counter lets you do is have that reliable data that you can then take and analyze and manipulate you know, however you see fit when you're thinking about collection development. And um, Phil is going to talk about that a little bit more in the next part of the presentation and uh, Scarlett as well. So what is a counter report? I've made a lot of references to this and I've talked about, you know, code of practice and standardized reporting and everything, but the, the meat of counter is this counter report. So what is, what actually is that? What is this usage report? Um, and there are a few different types of reports that counter um, has laid out for you to use. So there's four main types of reports. There's platform, title, database, and item. And basically each of these types of reports is made to be able to evaluate a different, a, a different electronic resource. So platform is going to look at 
every resource available on a single provider platform. So if you have a whole bunch of different kinds of resources from ProQuest, you know, say you have databases and eBooks and journals and streaming video, um, the platform report will get all of that that you can evaluate on one report. They can get a little unwieldy because it has so much on it, but um, that is available. Title report is the one that we use the most and that I typically find is usually the most helpful. So that looks at all of the individual titles that were used from a publisher or a platform. So think about um, a Taylor and Francis ebook collection. You'll be able to run a title report for those ebooks and see the title of every ebook that was used and how many times it was used under the date that you set. Databases, again, um, uh, you know, you have all sorts of different resources available and databases are sort of tricky because it can be hard to imagine how a database usage is comparable to an ebook usage and I'll get into metrics a little bit later but so that's looking at, um, you know, how many times a database is searched, what kind of results the users are clicking on when they're searching it, you know, if they're getting to full text, if they're only getting to um, abstracts, if it's a database index, you know, if they're linking out to wherever that full text is hosted. That's all included in database reports. And then the most granular, um, sort of gone from highest level to lowest level here, is item reports. Um, and this one we don't use too much because it, it is very specific. Um, I guess we usually are looking at title reports for, for our use, um, but you know everybody uh, does different evaluations. So that's looking specifically at um, individual articles and then also multimedia. So if you have a lot of streaming video um, or you license movies, something like that, that will show up in the item in an item level report, but then also individual journal articles. So, you know, if you're looking for, you know, maybe you have faculty or something um, that's interested in usage for um, articles that they've written, um, or you're looking specifically for, you know, like to see kind of uh, how many, uh, like COVID articles were used in a specific journal that will get that granular and item level. And so what is in a report? Uh, in the next slide, we're going to actually get eyes on what a counter report looks like. But before we do that, so it's not just complete data overload, I wanted to just talk about some of the data that shows up in a counter report. So again, I keep talking about this, this sort of ephemeral report, and I want to bring it into concrete reality now. So usually they take the form of an Excel spreadsheet. Um, they're available in a few different formats, typically, um, when you request them or download them. But I usually always work with them in an Excel format or upload it into a Google Sheet. But you know, typically, they come as a CSV or an um, Excel um, format. And this is the data that actually then is going to show up in your Excel sheet. So each one is sort of broken down into a few different areas of data and data elements. So there's going to be the header information, uh, which has sort of all of the boilerplate things for the counter report. So we talked about how there were um, platform, item, database, title. That header information will have uh, what kind of report you ran, the code for that report, uh, the date that you ran it, the date range that you were interested in looking at. So say like you were looking at usage for 2022, it, it shows those dates that you selected, um, you know, institution, that sort of thing. So that that boilerplate at the top, but that's also important because it lets you know that it's a valid um, uh, counter report and that it's following all the guidelines. Uh, and then there's going to be the actual resource information. So we talked about a title report earlier for like Taylor and Francis eBooks. The resource information will have rows for all of the actual electronic resources that are showing up in this report. So, you know, the title of the book, um, publisher, the platform, the URL, the ISBN, the ISSN, if it's a journal, that sort of thing, so that you can actually identify what the resource is that you're looking at. Um, so that's usually uh, the column or the row information, excuse me. And then in the column information, uh, you'll have dates sort of in the meat of the report. So it's broken down by month um, in the date range that you've selected so that you'll be able to look at the resource in the row and then go column by column for month and see how many times it was used in each month. 
And then um, the metrics, uh, these also show up sort of basically in the resource row information. So these are the specific um, counter compliant metrics that explain what the data is. And I'm going to get into metrics in a little bit more detail. Um, I think it's hard to explain without seeing it first. Like I said, we'll get to that in a second. But um, uh, that explains basically what the number means. So you see this number show up next to a, a book title for January, February, March of 2022. And that metric is going to label and explain what that is. And then the actual usage, right? What we're here for, that number of times that resource was used um, as described by the metric in the counter report. And like I said, that's broken down by month for that date range. So now that I've thrown all of this information at you, um, let's get to an example of an actual counter report and a closer look at it. And I apologize ahead of time. I know this might be small on some of your screens, but I wanted to try to capture as much information in it as I could. Um, and uh, it's funny, one time I, I had this open and a, a coworker walked by my computer when I was working with this and they said, oh my gosh, that is a lot of numbers. There's a lot of information going on there. And it's true, when you just look at it at a glance, it can be difficult to understand what's happening. Um, but I wanted to basically walk through now and break down those data elements that I was talking about earlier. So in rows one through 13 there at the top, you can see that's sort of like that boilerplate report information. So you can see the name, the institution, um, the date it was run, and the reporting period. So you can see this is um, an example that I use. So this is our um, Taylor and Francis ebook collection. Um, and it was run for the uh, calendar year of 2021. Uh, and I ran this, I think, a couple of weeks ago. I forget. Uh, yeah, May 27th, so a, a week or two ago. So that's that boilerplate at the top. And then they have this nice blue line there on row 14 to sort of break down the um, headers for each of the uh, columns, so explaining what's going on in there. So title, again, so that's the actual resource that is being reported on. And you can see then there's information for the publisher, the platform, the ISBN. Uh, that YOP is year of print, so that's when it was actually published. So uh, Biomimetics, um, this is the 2012 publication of Biomimetics. I don't know if there's more than that, but that's just an example. Uh, the metric type, which again, I'm gonna get into in a little bit more detail in a second, but that's basically explaining what those numbers are that then follow it. Um, and that's the reporting period total. And then you can see January, February, March, so on for the actual months. Uh, so one nice thing about counter reports is they offer that reporting period total. So they automatically do a summation of all of the usage for that resource for the time period that you set. So biomimetics was used twice um, in all of last year. Um, and then we have one, what is this? Um, entrepreneurial financial management had some good usage. It was used um, 43 times uh, last year. So maybe it was used for a class, you know, maybe one person was using it a whole lot. Uh, and that's something too that you can break out to when, you, when you're thinking about um, collection analysis and development. Um, and if you're paying attention or you're looking closely, you'll notice that um, most of the titles are duplicated here. So there'll be two rows for each one. And I'll explain that in a little bit um, because that has to do with metrics. Um, and again, this is all sort of getting back to demystifying and, and making this, this less threatening. But really the meat of it here is these little numbers that come over towards the right of the Excel sheet, um, breaking that down saying this resource was used this many times during this month of this year. And uh, that's sort of where you can then um, use that data to make informed decisions. So making sense of metrics. <laughs> I was talking again about how um, this can get a little bit confusing, um, but I found this great graphic that's actually from the counter website. Um, and I think it helps explain it. So uh, earlier I talked about how there are four different kinds of reports, basically for the resource that you're looking at. You know, if it's a platform, a title, a database, or an individual item like an article or a video. In the same way, there are metrics um, to apply for each of those different types of resources. So there are requests, investigations, 
searches. And then the last one is kind of specific, but it's no license. Um, so that one is specifically just for denied access. If somebody tried to get into the full text of something that you didn't have, you know, like download an ebook, get into a PDF, and you don't have it, that would show up as a no license. Um, but I'll start back at the top and explain these a little bit more. So a request is basically like you're thinking about requesting um, an item. You have a PDF of a resource and a user wants to go in and actually look at that, they're requesting access to that PDF, that full text. So that's what a request measures. Actually somebody going in and requesting access to read that resource. Um, and you can see that sort of like this blue section there in the graphic over there to the right. So they're looking at the full text, whether it's either, you know, HTML based, if it's on the website, if it's in a PDF form and they're downloading it, or if it's a video and, and they're watching it, that's going to show up as a request. An investigation is sort of like if somebody's not sure if this resource is actually what they're looking for and they just want to find out some more information about it, but maybe they're not getting all the way into the meat of that full text or that PDF, um, that, that's an investigation. So maybe they're just reading the abstract or they're following a link to the resource sort of like homepage, but not really getting in and reading it, um, or they're looking at a PDF preview, but not actually getting into the full text. Those would all be investigations because they're, they're trying to learn more about the resource, but they haven't really gotten into it yet. Um, and then searches, this is specific to those database um, uh, reports, because for uh, a lot of databases, they might um, just be indexes. So the database itself might not host the resource or the full text or that PDF. It might just point the user to where that lives. So the searches can be important too, because you know, the full text access for a database might be zero if it's uh, just an index, but you still could be getting a lot of use for it. Um, and that's what the searches lets you see how many times somebody searched that database, um, you know, whether or not they search just that specific one, or maybe if you have a bunch of ProQuest databases and they had 20 of them checked, you'll be able to see whether or not it was part of like that bundle search with 20 different databases checked, or if somebody singled it out specifically and they were interested just in searching that database. Um, and then again, no license I talked about that specifically just denied access, um, but that can be really important too in thinking about collection development. Maybe you have 100 ebooks from a publisher and um, you can see they've been getting some good use and you're thinking, oh, maybe we should get some more books from them. And you can go in and run a report for denied access and see these no license metrics and um, be able to look and say, oh, there were a lot of different titles that people were trying to get in and weren't able to. So that's another good way to use counter reports as well and another advantage of them. Um, and I'll go back one just to uh, get into it a little bit. So here, this is um, Again, a title report for eBooks. And you can see there in the metric type, it's looking at requests. So in this one, I was interested in, okay, I wanna see people that are actually getting into that PDF or that full text and reading the resource. And then again, I'm gonna get into the duplicated rows in a second. That's the next part. <laughs> Metrics can be a little bit complicated. Um, so a detail on metrics is unique versus total. Um, and this is something that Counter 5 uh, is new to Counter 5 and that Counter 5 offers. So they actually split their metric definitions into unique or total. And this was basically a solution to trying to get rid of um, the following scenario. So say you have somebody who is um, you know, using one of your electronic resources, they go in and they click on the same link 12 times while they're there on the website and they open up the PDF 12 different times. Traditionally, that would have been counted as 12 uses. So suddenly you're looking at this like, oh, wow, this, you know, somebody accessed this ebook 12 different times. This is great. You know, it's getting all this usage when really it was just one person who, for whatever reason, clicked on it 12 times. Well, that's not really 12 uses, or in most cases, it wouldn't be considered. So the unique metrics are able to discount those multiple clicks within a single user session. 
So again, um, if somebody say like on Tuesday, they go in and they read the ebook and then you know, on Thursday, they need to go back in and study it, that would be a different session. So that's really kind of two uses. They're going in and it would be counted as two separate unique uses. But if on Tuesday, somebody goes in and while they're on the web page just one time, they, you know, their screen freezes or something, they click on it 12 times because they're impatient, it opens up in 12 different tabs. It's only going to count one of those clicks. It's only going to count the first one and discredit the rest, which is really useful because it, it gets that picture of, you know, actual or real use. Um, and it kind of gets rid of that um, click inflation that can happen. Um, and that did happen under previous systems like counter Ford didn't um, differentiate between unique and total. And it does, uh, Counter 5 does still provide then those total metrics. So that does include all of those clicks. Um, and this does provide a slightly inflated use. But uh, again, this is just going back to sort of the transparency so that um, you can see, you know, maybe for whatever reason, you don't trust the unique usage or you do want to see how many times somebody clicked on it, even if it's within the same user session. You can see both of these. Um, and, you know, the total will still show all of the times anybody clicked on one of those uh, links or those electronic resources. And if you go back again here to um, the spreadsheet, that explains why these show up. So by default, the counter reports, unless you, you filter it, you know, either before you request the report or if you go into Excel and filter it afterwards, it's going to give you both so that you can get a full view of everything that happened for access of these resources. So you can see that's why it shows up twice if you're looking at that metric type there in like row 15 and 16, you'll see one is total requests and then one is unique requests. Uh, and just another quick note on that, when we're doing our analysis and our usage gathering, we're typically looking at unique um, and I've noticed that a lot of times if um, you're asking a vendor or a publisher to provide you reports, they'll typically give you the total instead, just to make the numbers look a little bit better because, you know, they're trying to sell you something. They want to they wanna sell you something or have you subscribe to it. So they want the number to look as big as possible. Um, and again, all of this information you can find on the Project Counter website and, and learn more about it. But it's, it's about giving you the power to understand the difference and how these are recorded and saying, oh, well, you know, we're looking looking at unique um, metrics. So we don't think the usage is actually quite as high as you're saying, um, but that can be, again, a very powerful tool for the librarians to use uh, when you're making collection development decisions. And uh, so now I've talked about um, Project Counter and the code of practice and what actually a report looks like and all of the great and confusing data that goes into a report. So how do you actually get them? How do you get to the counter reports? Um, and the quick answer is you request them. So how do you request them? Um, Project Counter itself does not generate these reports. Um, they have just created the code of practice and all of the guidelines that the publishers have to abide by in order to create their reports. So the reports are actually made by all of the different publishers or platforms. So here on the right, I have an example, um, Taylor and Francis for that um, ebook report that I um, showed earlier. This was how I got to it. You actually have to go to the publisher website um, and, and get it from them. So the way we do that is we actually have um, an ele electronic resource management system called Coral, which is basically just um, somewhere where we store all of our information um, when we sign new licenses or agreements. Um, and that keeps all of the information we have for admin accounts for these different publishers. So if we you know, buy 100 new eBooks um, from Taylor and Francis, or if we start a new journal subscription, or we buy a new package or database, we'll make sure that we, excuse me, record those accounts um, in Corals so that we can go in later um, and basically find this information. So typically you'll get to usage reports from an admin account. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of the work that goes into usage uh, usage reports is figuring out how to get into an admin account. You, I spend so much time with customer service um, and talking to people basically saying, hey, I'm trying to get our counter reports. Uh, where can I find them on your website? How do I, you know, our account information's out of date. I need to update it. Can you help me with that? Um, but that's basically the starting point. If you're not sure where to start, 
just try to go and find the login page for whichever you know publisher you're looking at um, or resource you're trying to evaluate and and start there and try to find the login and then get to that section and if you've gone into any admin accounts for publishers this image is probably going to look very familiar if you haven't this is a pretty um, standard example of what they look like. You know, you'll go in and there'll be things for Mark and KBART, um, institutional settings, sometimes holdings or, you know, access. Um, and then typically there'll be that usage um, section. So you can see there in the little tab, there's usage reports and the ability to request reports. Um, and a quick note earlier, I mentioned sometimes um, the bigger publishers might offer their own custom reports um, and they'll have them in the same section there. So you'll see like um, if they offer custom reports, just make sure you're clicking on the counter ones if they're counter compliant. Um, so to actually request reports, you can see this is sort of a typical um, uh, again, because it's hosted by the publisher, they're the ones actually creating the report. It looks a little bit different depending on the publisher, you know, the interface that you're using to request these reports. Um, but this is a pretty typical one here for Taylor and Francis. So you, uh, most of them uh, have sort of presets that'll say, I want to look at all of our journal titles, or I want to look at all of our eBooks, or I want to look at, you know, normal database usage. There are those preset reports that you can just go in and say, okay, I want this one for this date range and, you know, click request. And then they'll, you know, depending on how you have it set up on that platform, either email it to you or it might download as an Excel file. Um, or Counter also offers um, these sort of master reports that you can um, customize what metrics and data you want to show up there. Um, that can get pretty tricky uh, unless you're really knowledgeable. So it's a better idea to go sometimes with um, the standard reports that they offer. And then also, if you're not familiar with this or you haven't done it before, you might navigate your way here to this admin profile, click on request report, and then suddenly you're somewhere else and it links you out to a third party person. You're like, wait, what's going on? That's normal, um, especially some of the mid and smaller sized publishers. Um, they don't have the resources to actually make all these reports themselves, so they might hire like a third party that you link out to that actually gives you the report using their data. So um, uh, a platform called Adapon is one of the very common ones. So if you're getting into this work and suddenly you link out to a place called Adapon, that's pretty standard and, and you'll sort of get the hang of it as you go through it. And I can't talk about uh, requesting reports without briefly mentioning Sushi. So I talked about acronyms earlier. Sushi is a great one. Um, unfortunately, it's not, it's not, I don't think it quite lives up to the hype of the acronym. I love Sushi, but um, the food, but not so much the, um, the counter version. So this stands for Standardized Usage Statistic Harvesting Initiative. And basically it's just a very technical way of saying automated counter report delivery. So Sushi was this idea that, um, you know, it can be a huge investment of time and resources to go and manually pull usage reports and counter reports if you have resources from, you know, a dozen or a hundred different publishers. That could take, you know, be an entire job in and of itself for somebody to do that. So Sushi lets you do it um, through an automated system. Um, but I will note that not all counter compliant platforms are necessarily Sushi compliant. Um, so just because they do counter or they you know, offer counter reports doesn't mean that they'll offer sushi. Um, and also that the setup varies by platform. Um, and one other thing to note with sushi is that really it's just sort of an automated API that lets a system go out and grab that report using um, credential information. So in order to really utilize sushi, you have to have some sort of library platform um, that allows for sushi integration. And I know that sounds very complicated, um, but, uh, and I'm not a sushi expert. If you're interested in that, I would really recommend doing a little bit more research on the on the counter project website. Um, but it is an option if you were interested in automated reports, um, sushi is available. So bringing it all back to collection development, I see I'm just a couple of minutes over, but Phil, I think, was uh, aware that I might run a little bit uh, long, so I hope he's ready for that. But um, bringing it all back to collection development, so I've 
you know, try to get into the details of what a counter report is, you know, what project counter is, what those reports look like and sort of how to get them. Um, but why are you even interested in getting them in the first place? It, it gives you power as librarians to make collection development decisions and make data informed decisions, most importantly. You know, you can keep statistics on um, circulation of print items through any various, you know, most library systems allow that. Um, but how do you do it for these electronic resources where it's just hosted on a platform and they control it? and you know, how do you really evaluate that usage? That's what counter allows you to do. It allows you to look at that data and to collect it yourself and make your own decisions using it and use it to calculate things like, you know, a simple cost per use. How many times is a, a resource actually getting used for how much money we spend on it? Where are we spending all of our money and how much use are we getting for the, you know, the dollar that we're putting in? Um, and with that note, that really starts uh, going into Phil's presentation, so I'll use that as a segue. Uh, so thank you for listening to me ramble on for like 33 minutes about counter reports. Uh, again, if you have specific questions, I'll be happy to answer them in the Q&A, uh, combined Q&A at the end. Um, but without further ado, uh, for the interest of time, I will stop my slideshow and I will pass it over to my colleague, Phil Hewitt. Thanks, Greg. Great job, man. <laughs> okay, so let me share my screen here. And um, if anyone does have questions throughout my part, you know, I'll try to be able to stay on top of looking at the chat if you have questions, um, just in case. And this will be pretty informal. And feel free to interrupt me if anyone sees that there's a question in chat. Uh, feel free to do that. Okay, so. Can everybody see my screen okay? Thumbs up, thank you, Scarlett. Yes, you're good. Thanks, Nathan, appreciate it. Um, okay, so uh, moving on from, from Greg's great introduction to the counter reports and some of the talks we had today by, uh, by Nathan um, and, uh, and Stephanie, really great, great discussions about how to use this data. What I wanted to do was think about uh, different narratives that we kind of told ourselves at the Lehigh University Library and how through assessing data, we were able to rethink those and change them and talk about some of the impacts, impacts and outcomes of the work that we've done here. Um, and we'll use some usage data examples related to counter and then at least one related to other types of data. So to introduce myself, I'm Phil Hewitt. I'm a, an engineering and electronic collections librarian at Lehigh University. I, uh, I'm a research and instruction librarian, as well as uh, I've done a lot of work in e-resource management, and I'm kind of moving into more of a collection strategist type of role here, which is trying to look at some of the bigger picture things and think about the, the large questions about what, what we do with, with our money here in collections. So move into the next tier. Um, so the examples I'm gonna go over are uh, example assessments and narratives that we've, we've worked through uh, to using counter data, usage of academic journals and usage of research databases in science and engineering. And then with other types of data, we're just gonna look at, I'm gonna take us through a little bit of an assessment and project we did allow, around who uses interlibrary loan. So some context, Lehigh University is a private R2 university located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. We have a student FT of about 6,800. We're a merged organization with technology and instructional technology, which gets interesting. Um, we have two physical libraries and we have a collections budget of more than 4 million, um, which I think is about half of what, um, what Stephanie and uh, Case Western has, but a lot of money. What do we spend it on? That's what we're gonna get into. So a uh, prior narrative, this is kind of our first assessment that we're going through, was that acad academic journals are by far the most important resource, resource the libraries provide. Usage is extremely high and accurate and publishers won't work with us. So we need more money due to cost increases. The impact of that narrative of what we were telling ourselves with that 
was that more than 80% of the library's collections budget was spent on academic journal subscriptions, which left little money for books or other resources. The budget requests always focused on journal subscriptions. So I think when we were making requests to administrators, you know, we were always asking for the same thing, which uh, may not have been as impactful as uh, making requests based off of uh, for different new resources that might have been exciting. And our relationships with our publisher reps, our publisher sales representatives were transactional. They weren't really based around telling a story, telling our story. Uh, a lot of it was based around cost per use and, you know, where are we getting the value and, you know, what new journals came out and all of those types of things. So we assessed that and in testing that, uh, that assumption or that narrative, we found that it was mostly true that direct access to, to journals was really important, but to many, uh, it probably wasn't 80% of the value of our collections. The extremely high usage was somewhat untrue. You know, we probably, we thought we were getting about 800,000 uses a year of, of journal articles. But once, once we understood a little bit better that counter uh, four to counter five unique versus um, a total kind of item request uh, difference, we saw that our, our usage decreased a lot. And that was because of people going in seeing the HTML full text that getting counted as a click and then downloading the PDF and that getting counted as another use. So we, we saw that there was a lot of duplication that way. Um, another thing with the move from counter four to counter five code of practice that happened was that we uh, started that that code of practice started to remove from the standard views um, open access usage. So as open access, people paying to open journals or publishers making journal articles open after a certain amount of time, as that kind of grows in popularity, um, we, we've started to, to not count those because they, they weren't paid for by us in a sense, they were paid for by someone else. So um, including uses of those uh, for these reports was, was kind of taken out. And it was mostly untrue. A lot of, uh, as far as vendor reps working with us or not, a lot were willing to listen and consider the data and the narrative that we started to tell based around the data. So some of the data, just to talk about it at a high level, um, just removing the gold open access and duplicate usage of our journal articles, we saw a decrease in usage of 30% across all publisher platforms that would differ by publisher platform, but it was it was a big impact. You know, if you if you think that something's you know, extremely valuable and you use it, you know, a hundred times a month, but then, you know, if you really find out you only use it 70 times, that makes, that makes a big impact, especially when we're talking about cost per use. Um, and all these things are at such a big scale of, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of what we spend on journal subscriptions that even, even these minor points are really important. Um, what we did after, you know, just that look from, of the more accurate usage data, the unique title or unique item requests, we also took that a step further. And what we did uh, was try to think about not just, okay, you know, we understand that our usage is less, but also think about different sources that there might be for these journal articles. So we subscribe to aggregated um, indexes and that include full text from EBSCO and ProQuest and other vendors. And we tried to think about, um, for those for those resources, if they're available, if these journal articles are available from from there, why do we why are we counting uh, this availability directly from the publisher as unique? We also tried to take out looking at stuff that we owned already. So with a lot of academic publishers, uh, librarians over the years, over the last 15, 20 years, have said, you know, when we buy something, we want to have access to it forever. It's called perpetual access or post cancellation access. Um, so, you know, you accrue all these years of perpetual access or post cancellation access, but mm -hmm. every year if you're doing a cost per use analysis based off of the total or even the unique number of item requests, you're counting things that you've already purchased. So we yeah. tried to remove all of these kind of uh, duplicates and think about, okay, what is uniquely available through this subscription that we can get elsewhere. And as you can see in the tables here, that made a pretty big difference. Um, and, you know, 
generally researchers are pretty happy to get access to these things in, in these different formats. It might be a little less convenient to have to go through um, our link resolver or something like that, but in terms of what we're paying for and the value we're getting for it, we thought that that was an important consideration. And the new narrative that we're kind of, or at least I'm, I'm saying, and we, we do discuss this with faculty and administrators as well, is that academic journal subscriptions are important, but probably not 80% uh, of our budget important. We need to have, have money to be able to support different types of research that aren't specifically focused on academic journals, um, different resources, and, and try to support research a little bit more equitably, not having so much of our money tied up into one resource type. Uh, publishers should work with us if we tell a consistent data informed and assertive narrative and all of those things are important. Um, telling a narrative consistently every year, the first year may not be successful with negotiations, but telling that same story year after year and, and consistently across your organization is important as well. Um, and Greg brought this up as well, but making data informed decisions there's a good distinction between data driven. Uh, I'm a big believer in the expertise of, of library workers. And you know, if we're making data driven kind of decisions, sometimes we're not allowing our expertise in there. So um, that's a good distinction as well. And being assertive, you know, we've gotten so many negotiated discounts and cancellations just by you know believing in what we're saying and making sure we we valued our voice in saying that to the vendors or to faculty if they're saying you know why did you cancel this journal you know we we feel pretty confident that we've done done the work and that we have expertise so um, we feel pretty good about about these these narratives that we're telling now uh, and the new narrative you know is that we do have money to support research and learning more broadly through our collections and one of the outcomes has been that we've subscribed to a much broader set of resources uh, due to some of the other outcomes that we've been able to negotiate journal subscription costs down at least 500,000. Um, and we've canceled about 500,000 more in journals. So um, it's a pretty big impact and a thing we've been able to do by using counter, counter data to, to test our assumptions and our narratives that we tell. Uh, moving on, I did want to cover some abstract and indexing kind of database examples. So um, we had a lot of money, about 52% of our research databases budget was spent on four databases, solely or mainly supporting science and engineering. And we couldn't really afford, you know, that's 52% of our budget. We couldn't really afford other, other resources from that budget line. So uh, we had to test this assumption that these are still very useful as the costs increased. We had to make sure that we were assessing that and seeing what we're spending our money on and whether we're getting good value for it. What we found was that that assumption that abstract and, and indexing databases are you know, extremely or very important to science and engineering research uh, was becoming less and less true. There were significant continual declines in use. And, um, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about why we hadn't tested this assumption before. And this is kind of where it's cool to wear two hats. You know, I'm a research and instruction librarian for engineering, but I'm also working on e-resources and collections. Um, and one thing I've kind of anecdotally found out is that when we're using a tool to help people, we kind of have this, this affinity and this connection to it. And so it's important to balance that kind of anecdotal or qualitative understanding with some quantitative data as well. And also to be uh, growth-minded and open-minded about, you know, this tool isn't something that's being used anymore. What are some other ways that we can still help people find information? So the data was pretty obvious in this example, pretty easy to spot the trends, uh, the top level, uh, report here is just one from Web of Science, which is a big um, kind of multidisciplinary database, but still with a little bit of a focus on, on science uh, STEM, STEM uh, coverage of its, of, its, of its content. And the other one down at the bottom there is just a table of some of the decreases in, in different search types for SciFinder. 
Um, so, you know, even though these data are pretty similar in negotiating, we saw pretty different outcomes with each of the vendors. We had a 50% cost decrease for one, 10% for the other. And also we didn't see this decline across the board when we're looking at databases in psychology and education. You know, there might've been slight decreases, but they were still pretty important to that research. So we're able to kind of understand that it wasn't just abstracting and indexing databases that were declining in value, but specifically and use, but specifically for certain subsets of our, of our researchers. And we're telling that new narrative now that they are of lessening importance and we're okay with that. And we'll find other ways to help people find the information. Um, and I think this has been an important assessment of, 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 like I spoke about before, questioning how our own value impacts of, of different resources um, determines how we assess them. And we were able to, with those databases and looking at that, that usage, we were able to negotiate costs down 50%. And we also uh, canceled a few databases that, that we just couldn't, couldn't get down to a reasonable amount. The outcome from canceling those was that we added a lot of databases and primary sources supporting the social sciences, humanities, and business. The final narrative uh, kind of I want to go through here is that uh, we were telling ourselves that our researchers have equitable access to journal articles. And therefore, you know, the assumption would be that uh, researchers across the board used inter interlibrary loan to access journals, um, that there wouldn't be any kind of real differences by, by, uh, by the type of user who was requesting it. And because of that, you know, we kind of got into this uh, mode of spending on STEM journals and we continued to do that. And we didn't always look at how equi equitably we we're spending across different research areas. What we found in testing that assumption that was that it was largely untrue, that the time burden of making interlibrary loan requests fell largely on certain groups of people. And in looking at the data here, you can see who those types of people were. Um, I wanted to do a look uh, by assumed gender. Obviously, I didn't know the gender identities of the of the users that I was that I was um, looking at with this data. But just in looking at the top twenty five users. Um, Almost all of those top 25 users were may have identified as, as women, as female. And um, you can pretty staggering difference when that's it's almost the opposite. We had we do have more male than, than female faculty. Uh, this confirmed a belief that we were under supporting some colleges and departments. And that's something that we kind of expected because of turnaway data and other data that we had collected. Uh, we did see turnaway related to some education journals before, and it's kind of interesting how, you know, as you work with these data around collections, you're able to put together all these different pieces uh, from different data sources to try to tell that full narrative. And by college, if you look at the, of course, the pie chart, <laughs> which obviously not the best way to visualize data, but um, useful here, perhaps, uh, more than half of, of the interlibrary loans by the top 25 users were uh, people within our College of Education, which at Lehigh is, is a relatively small college. So we saw, you know, we were kind of overburdening um, women researchers and also specifically researchers in the College of Education uh, as to who we were not subscribing to the materials that they might request and want to access. So the new narrative is that our collections expenditures can reflect in inequities, causing some users to be better served than others. Um, one of the outcomes of that analysis was that we did subscribe to uh, a lot of the top most requested journals uh, that were requested via interlibrary loan by users in the College of Education. And we did that by being able to cancel journals in other areas like STEM journals. So um, yeah, putting these different analyses together you can see how they're related to one another and how they can hopefully help us better serve our, our researchers and our users. Just some high level conclusions and a thought for the future. You know, at Lehigh University, testing the current narratives that we're telling ourselves, assessing them using usage data has been very impactful. And we've really transformed our collections through that. Um, you know, we've been able 
I, I've been able to lead savings of more than you know a million dollars. And we think about the things that we've been able to purchase with those that we hadn't been able to provide before. Um, it, it can be really impactful. And you know, especially with that last example, but like I said, all of these different data points come together to tell a whole picture. I do think we need to continue and investigate our current practices and, and belief structures, like saving the time of the reader more deeply, thinking not just of saving each reader individually, but over the over the big picture, you know, whose time is it that we're saving and to, to what extent, um, considering our limits on resources. And that's, that's all I've got. So um, if there are any questions, I'd love to answer them. But um, we do have one here. How did you message statements like we misunderstood the usage? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Greg would probably say I'm not, <laughs> not one to be easily embarrassed. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, no, I, and Christina, to your question, I've, I've had the same things. And frankly, I've kind of presented some data, you know, the data I present to publishers and negotiating with them is sometimes different than the data I present to administrators. So, um, which they, did, they have different emphases, but that's a great question. Um, and how would I answer that? Um, I mean, it's a big, it's a big difference if you're talking about a 30% decline in use. Um, how I would probably spin that is, you know, um, making sure I co-present it with, with context and, and an understanding of what people are using. Um, and instead of just focusing on, you know, we've got this wrong, but yeah, good question. And I'd love to know more about how you utilize these results to engage with your faculty and administrators. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, again, I'm a pretty open book. So, you know, with my faculty, if, if I think that a journal should be canceled, you know, I'll contact them and say, you know, hey, here's the data, here's how much we spend on it. And frankly, once every time I've spoken with faculty and I've been like, hey, this is what this cost, and this is how frequently you and other researchers use it, they've always been reasonable. Um, uh, well, <laughs> maybe not always, that might have been a stretch, but um, again, I think it's just about being kind of confident in your own expertise. And if you have a good understanding of the data and you believe that you're doing the right thing, um, those, those conversations go, go pretty well. Because a lot of times they are negative conversations, either the, we got this wrong or the, hey, you can't have this anymore conversation. You got to go in kind of, you know, confident in, in what you're doing and think about the big picture, you know. Yeah, you know, we can't get this journal for you, but guess what? This person who's requested 150 interlibrary loan requests over the last three years, when you've made two, you know, we're going to get them the journal they need. Um, so looking at the big picture can help too. Did you compare percentage of ILL by assumed gender with percentage of enrollment at university by gender? Um, I didn't, I know those percentages pretty well, but the more, um, it was just a top 25 list of users and most of them were grad students or faculty members. So, and I did, I did look at um, comparing those with even the faculty in the College of Education. And it was, uh, there were definitely differences, um, even though College of Education, you know, I was kind of thinking, oh, maybe that's more women faculty, but that, that wasn't the case. So um, there's something at play there, who knows what it is. How did you calculate the 30% decrease? Uh, yep, yeah, well, it was just a fiscal year look. So um, yeah, it was using for a prior year using counter four and then the next year using counter five. Uh, that was before the pandemic. So um, the pandemic has had a continued impact on declined usage for us. I don't think that's the case everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, we've seen some impact of that with, with the pandemic but not, not that serious, not that much. Okay, thanks everybody. Any final questions before I pass it on to Scarlett? I think we're gonna take a brief break oh, okay. cool. and come back at 3 p.m. for Scarlett. Um, but thank you very much for uh, your presentation and Greg, thank you for yours. It's a different way to look at statistics and what 
that can do for us. It's very important to adjust um, what your the statistics to your audience so that they can understand, you know, the points that you're trying to make. And you've been able to do that, obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a brief break and we'll be back at 3 p.m. Um, for Scarlett um, and her talk to finish up the counter presentation. Thank you. It looks good. Okay. Well, welcome back and welcome to Scarlett. Um, Scarlett's going to be our, our, our bring it on home third member of the um, counter team. Um, <clears throat> Scarlett is um, the area lead for assessment and planning and the collection strategist librarian at Grand Valley State University Libraries where she develops and leads efforts towards a more sustainable open collection. Her research focuses on the socio-political aspects of library services platforms and scholar, scholarly communications. Her recent work includes keynotes at both the National and the Minnesota Electronic Resources 2022 meetings. And Scarlett also serves as a member of the scholarly publishing and academic resources coalitions executive steering committee. And here's Scott Scar Scarlett to bring it on home with the final counter presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so having tested this a little bit beforehand, can people see my presentation slides or is it being kind of blinky? It's black right now. Okay, I wonder what's going on. Hmm. I there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it keeps vanishing and I don't know why that is. It seems like we can only see the upper right hand corner when it vanishes. Yeah. Okay. So I wonder um, if you can scale the Yeah, the... I think I think I might have to just um present from the beginning here and hope for the best uh in terms of my memory. <laughs> um so uh my apologies about that. Um I am really lucky to uh, uh, be following uh, Greg and Phil's work. Uh, it sounds like Lehigh is doing, uh, I think, some really interesting uh, investigation of what it is that we're doing uh, when we look at counter reports and, and what is it that exactly we are, are looking at and assessing uh, when it comes to electronic resource usage. And I mean, electronic resources are old enough to uh, have gone through um, grad school, found a tenure track job and gotten tenure at this point. And so that we uh, are kind of in a position where we're not necessarily as a group asking questions about, about use is an interesting one. So it's always good to see people um, interrogating what these kinds of structures might mean. Uh, thanks everyone who organized this event. Uh, I know it's a lot of numbers and spreadsheets and, and things like that, but we'll have a little bit of fun, or at least I'll try to, um, while I wrap some of this up. Um, I'm Scarlett. I'm the Collection Strategist Librarian at Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. Uh, at GVSU, that means that I'm responsible for the library's negotiation frameworks, our reinvestment priorities, strategies around the collections and services, developing policy, and also assessment projects related to all that. And although I'm not a Buckeye anymore, my cat is. Uh, I adopted her when I was a grad student at Kent State in Ohio, so there is a little bit um, of Ohio still in this presentation. And if I were doing this from home, she would definitely be pacing across the screen right now. So. Um, a little bit of institutional context about Grand Valley. Um, uh, we're an R3. Uh, we're a big public state university with about 23,000 students. And our faculty very much pride themselves on and use this phrase teacher scholar model quite a bit, which means that we have a lot of faculty researching, you know, praxis and assessment and using a variety of pedagogies to get at um, a number of different kinds of students that are all at different places in that um, sort of continuum and journey that people are on in terms of uh, going to or being part of, you know, university or even returning. Um, and uh, infrastructure wise, we moved our ILS from Sierra to Folio in June of 2021. So like Lehigh, we are also making those similar, uh, similar kinds of transitions about um, how we store and how we manage a lot of the um, infrastructure of the collection. 
So I'm going to give um, a couple of different scenarios here. And you know what I really want to talk about today is that counter is a picture that's in need of a frame, almost always. Uh, counter is usually a starting point, not an end point for decision making, and it requires some context uh, in order for it to in order for you to sort of engage in sense making with counter counter data alone uh, doesn't necessarily tell us the whole story always I think that um, Philip and Greg have gone into that uh, pretty well, uh, but these are some examples from different libraries where. Uh, using counter data in conjunction with other kinds of data you might have access to will give you a different perspective um, on those kinds of narratives and stories that we tell ourselves. So how I have used counter uh, is primarily as a diagnostic tool. So it can tell me things about connectivity between systems. Uh, it can give me a snapshot of activity. And by that, I mean kind of a counter is a view into the past about what's happening. It's it's because it's not live. Um, it's like looking at a series of photographs or looking at an old, you know, one of the old tiny animation rings. I forget what those are called, um, but uh, you would put the put the little tape uh, inside and every, you know, if you spun it fast enough, you would see a horse, you know, running or something like that. Those those kinds of things. So so counter is a little like that in terms of its um, what it it's represent what is representing and what it's representational of. Um, encounter can be, um, like we've already said, a uh, starting place for return on investment analysis. I will try to get to chat questions, but I can't always see them. A zoetrope? I think that might be what it's called, yeah. So I have three scenarios, like I said, and three takeaways from this. Um, each institution that I'm referencing, although they're not going to be named, has different values and goals. Each library encounters different questions using counter data um, because, you know, not only do we have different goals or different ways that we kind of go about the mission in the university, it might look different in the library in terms of its application uh, and that we might value different things. Uh, some people place a premium on access. Some people place, you know, more emphasis on, you know, the strength of their resource sharing enterprise. Some people uh, emphasize open. Some people have generally more proprietary systems uh, in their libraries. It just depends, right? So where you're coming from is going to look different uh, at a lot of different institutions, even if they are peers institutionally, uh, they may be very different in terms of their libraries. So the first scenario I want to get at is um, a small public liberal arts college. Many alumni pursue graduate degrees. The library has a relatively flat organizational structure where information sharing is used to understand strategy and decisions. So lots of, can I look at a report? Can you tell me what it means? Here's how I teach this particular um, resource or database. Here's um, how I teach students how to evaluate inf information. Lots of going back and forth between say the resource management side of things and the um, liaison and teaching side of things, even for people who inhabit both spaces, um, like I know a lot of us do. So counter, Looking at counter alone, the, the use of American Chemical Society journals quadrupled in one year. There was no institutional memory of this ever happening before. So pulling that report was a little bit of a shock. And what might be happening? Could it be automated downloading? Right? We talked about that a little bit during the break. Are there maybe significantly more chemistry students? Has someone done a great deal of, of outreach and recruitment? Is there paper sharing going on? Um, if you want, if you are still connected, if you want to share in the chat what you think might be going on, I would love to hear someone's evaluation or, or love to hear someone's guess at this. Bots, someone suggests text mining. Yeah, those are good guesses for sure. Right, because this kind of stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. New assignments required across lots of sections. Yeah, my, my question was, is anybody in chemistry maybe teaching a section of general ed um, that's huge that we don't know about? One prof discovered it and used it for e-reserves. Yep, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, so, so we went in and investigated and I went and talked to the science librarian and said, um, vendor changed how they were counting use, also a possibility. Um, I went in and talked to the science librarian and I said, hey, 
do you have any idea what's going on? Are you are you teaching something different? It's not that it's that it's unexpected. This is just a lot. And it turned out uh, two of their faculty were on sabbatical um, and they were driving up the use that much. Uh, it meant that we might need to invest in some back files or think about how to better serve whatever their research agenda was when they came back. I was surprised that it was just two people, but there we are. Uh, sometimes when people have a lot of time on their hands, what they get to is their to be read pile. So our big takeaway from that is that not all unexpected use is fraudulent use. It might be a couple of researchers with time to get caught up on reading, right? Or just someone who's got, you know, a cadre of, of really, um, uh, really savvy grad students who are getting all the papers for them or something. It just depends. So um, there are, uh, before I get into the next scenario, scenario, I want to talk about reasonable answers and the stories that we tell ourselves about data. Um, way back in the before time, uh, I was in a, a physics class and uh, working on a series of homework exercises where I had to calculate the energy output from a light bulb, right? Which if you're in physics is a, is a fairly straightforward equation and I'm not going to get into it, but there's you know, a way that you go about solving that. And I was really excited that I had solved it because I'm, I'm not always the best uh, at that sort of thinking. And so I was excited that I had gotten an answer. Uh, and then my teacher at the time told me that the output um, that, I had, uh, that I had recorded, uh, somewhere I had um, multiplied or missed a step or something had happened and that the output of my light bulb was more appropriate if I were say measuring the energy output of the sun. And so my teacher had a good laugh. I had a good laugh about it, although I was a little embarrassed that I didn't catch that. Um, but after that, you know, you kind of learn to think about what is, what is reasonable. Does, it, does the data that's in front of me make sense? And this is important when we're looking at, at things like counter or things like working with counter in the library, um, especially for our second scenario. So scenario two is an R1 with a medical school, a residency program, and several specialized centers for research. So really high output, really deep investment um, in the institution, in the program, and in the research enterprise itself at all stages of the life cycle. The university at the time cut millions of dollars to the library's collections budget. And the idea was that the library would then seek input from faculty about which resources they wanted to keep. And they would do this by um, you know, providing feedback, I imagine very strong feedback, um, you know, to liaison groups and subject specialists and, and other folks that they you know, saw as avenues for communication. So one of the things uh, they did was look at interlibrary loan data because one of the data points encounter that uh, people were discovering and kind of interrogating a little bit was that a prestigious medical journal has almost no use according to two years of counter data. And there was also no request during the same period for interlibrary loan on this title because nothing says I want the thing quite like interlibrary loan does. Especially if someone is willing to navigate the user interface for that. And so this didn't make a whole lot of sense. So what might be the cause here? Is it a case of needing a resource when really the need is just my friends that I went to grad school with who are at another university like this one also have it and we should too? Was there an issue maybe with discovery or with the knowledge base or even with what the vendor thought that we were entitled to have access to? Because if the vendor's side of things isn't updated, then we're not going to get access. You'll see those denials go up, even if we should have it. And what's maybe going on in the learning management system? You know, one of the things that, that I've wanted to investigate, but I haven't figured out a way to do this without being deeply creepy about the whole thing, is um, how many people, when they had to rapidly move their courses online, just threw PDFs into the learning management systems for their courses, for their reading lists, for those kinds of things, and then weren't necessarily linking to the resource. So that would also mean uh, depressed use relative to what we might see. And I'm not going to ask you all for your take on this because it turns out there was something a little bit deeper going on. 
So there's a number of competing stories going on in the library at this time. You have one side saying that data is data and it's therefore unimpeachable. And you have another side saying something is happening with this data because um, medical health sciences and physical sciences liaisons were saying, everybody looks at, reads and references this journal. There has to be something else going on. And uh, all of this information was in, you know, a homegrown, you know, Excel, spree Excel spreadsheet, I can talk today, uh, or database or, you know, these kinds of things that we build when we need to look at a lot of data at once uh, and then try to communicate it out. So one side, you know, it was making a suggestion that faculty must not have participated in this process um, versus looking at sometimes data can be given nuance through individual experience. You know, the data is not, you know, thinking that data is good or bad or accurate or not is not a personal judgment. It's just, I have a story that makes that more complicated. Um, and then again, because this is a large cancellation, you have one particular facet of the library arguing that going after the most expensive subscriptions is the best way to absorb the cut versus resources are complex and often not as straightforward as on or off. So what happened with this is that there was a version control issue, which meant that in terms of data management, faculty vote tallies somehow overwrote the original counter data. And this was pretty embarrassing because you had a group of people that were doubling down on no, the data is the data and it's unimpeachable. And another group of people saying, but my experience knows that, you know, I've touched that journal more than two times in the last month, never mind anything else. So it took a while to kind of untangle that. But whenever there are that seems odd reasons, those are actually really good opportunities. The tensions that are on the previous slide here are actually really great opportunities to figure out where you're sitting and to build those kind of um, shared understanding about what a process might look like when you're talking about use, when you're talking about what we should keep and what we should reinvest in, the kinds of interrogating of narratives and assumptions that we make that were discussed in the other presentations. Uh, anytime you you know have that sense that something might be off, it's worth investigating just to see. The library really could have gained ground here and didn't, and it's unfortunate that that happened. Version control, oh my gosh. I still have nightmares about that spreadsheet when I found it. So the big takeaway from that experience is that significant decisions about the collection require many stakeholders at the table and that library workers can own our expertise that way. Um, we, we work with and touch the collection all the time. So a lot of different um, views and, and methods of analysis need to be brought in in order to kind of fully understand the data that we're looking at. And for our last scenario, so I think there are questions kind of bubbling up and I wanna give folks some time to ask that. A new colleague in the liaison group wants to know how to best direct their time and capacity. Good question. They ask about resource usage in their disciplines to learn more. Counter, in this case, shows us a high number of investigations of resources in the disciplinary areas your new colleague is covering. So we look at data in LibGuides because one of the things that they're told by colleagues and peers at other institutions is, oh, you should probably look at what your LibGuides are doing and see what's going on with that. But sometimes it's a rabbit hole, right? Those of us who've worked in LibGuides before, it can eat up a lot of time and you wanna make sure that you're investing it in ways that are gonna be useful for you. Either the guide is for yourself so that you're able to kind of get to information quickly uh, when you're showing it to someone or, you know, the guide is so that you can, uh, you know, sort of have the pre-consultation consultation where you direct people to a resource, have them, you know, kind of play with or even struggle with it for a little bit um, until you do some sort of intervention. So we looked at the data and uh, the generalist and intro guides actually that this person is responsible for now get very little use in this subject area, but the class specific guides get the highest use astronomical compared to anything else. Uh, but also counter investigations are really high, but the request numbers are low, disproportionately so. We know there's always gonna be a gap because total investigations is gonna be high. It's gonna 
be a little bit inflated, um, like we've mentioned in previous presentations. So we expect a little bit of a gap, but this gap is big. It could suggest a lot of different things and might give um, this new person an area to focus on or a way to think about how those resources are being taught and what kinds of interventions the library is making. So what might be the cause of this kind of data? So users may be skimming search results and headlines to stay current. That's probably true, especially if we're looking at a resource that is uh, really well indexed in a lot of different places. Then that means users are coming in from all over the place, um, not necessarily just you know one area. It may also mean that there are uneven levels of collaboration between teaching faculty and the library. So we've got a couple of people um, teaching classes where they're obviously directing their students to a course specific or assignment spe specific section of a LibGuide, but the generalist stuff just kind of isn't happening. And yet people will pour a lot of time and energy and stress um, into these things and believe that there is significant meaning in them. It may also mean that first and second year students might be using other resources. And it's when you kind of move into that, you know, third, fourth and fifth year um, that you get into your more, you know, disciplinary specific uh, tools and use those differently. It also might mean that it's a little frustrating to search, right? If you're having that many investigations, but really only a few requests. And so our takeaway from that is that when given a little bit of context, Counter can help us understand where to focus time and resources, which is increasingly pretty important. There was a comment in the chat about, you know, what, what impact does maybe the great resignation have on a lot of this stuff or kind of the, you know, the a little bit of slowing down and the people really kind of learning and exploring and figuring out where their boundaries are, what are we going to say no to, uh, those kinds of questions. So that may have something to do with that, uh, but you know, figuring out where we want to focus that limited time and energy is is important. This is one way we can think about it. Not always, and this is pretty was pretty specific to the situation, but it meant that you know uh, we've got a new liaison who isn't going to focus time on resurrecting a libguide that doesn't get very much use, um, and may spend time thinking more about resources that get heavier use and thinking about how to educate people on how to make more effective searches. So some other mitigating factors that have come up. So many providers unlocked content during the initial COVID shutdown in 2020. And at the same time, you also have a number of providers migrating from counter four to counter five during this time as well. Some of the um, some of the of the usage uh, categories map fairly cleanly, others don't. Um, like we've covered uh, some some of those metrics are kind of not necessarily lost, but just aren't as intensely focused on in um, in the fifth release. So, um, you know, any sense of longitudinal data would be very interesting. Um, anyone who's making uh, longitudinal claims about um, counter data that includes migration from four to five uh, in terms of what's going on, will have to really kind of look at their methodology and seeing how they're mapping those terms. Um, and then remote teaching, learning, and working will influence statistics depending on local configurations. And I think that's why we're seeing so many different stories and narratives coming out of, um, you know, the pivot to remote or or any of these other kinds of kinds of factors. Because I think it really depends on what what structures were already in place when um, when the shutdown happened. Uh, I think that is probably more of a determining element. Uh, than a lot of a lot of other uh, possible interventions, but I have yet to really kind of test that uh, test that theory in any kind of you know uh, research environment. Um, and I would love to see some of the um, issues that I know were um, kind of prevalent, like with overcounting or with um, uh, platform and provider um, multipliers or bias. Uh, that that kind of research that was done on counter four, I would love to see it repeated on five uh, to see if um, if the move to five mitigated some of those uh, concerns. And um, the last bit that uh, I want to offer is that, of course, counter has limitations. Like uh, my thought about, well, maybe people just threw PDFs into Blackboard and called it a day rather than linking to you know things directly. But 
I don't need to know anything more about that. Those limitations shouldn't be a justification to engage in limitless surveillance and what's going on um, in terms of the learning environment. So from an ethical standpoint, I only want to know the minimum necessary in order to improve services and make collections decisions. So because it, it would be really easy right now, I think, to kind of come in and say, well, we could tell you, you know, exactly how many uses it was in Blackboard. All you have to do is say yes to heavy surveillance um, of what's going on in everyone's uh, instance of a course in their learning management system. I'm really not interested in that. Um, and if anyone here wants to chat, um, my email is at the end of the slide, and I am mostly panoptigoth on social media. And I will stop sharing for a moment. But those are my, uh, those are my uh, uh, slides and thoughts on this. I wanted to uh, leave things a little bit more open. I, uh, just for Q&A, because I know so many of us have uh, different experiences with counter and with use and then with kind of crafting and otherwise challenging uh, the narratives around uh, resource usage in libraries, especially what's important, right? We have to have this. We have to do these things. Um, do we really? Do we really need it? Um, you know, one of the conversations we've been having with um, the uh, engineering department uh, is that uh, they really need standards. You know, we need a purchasing solution for engineering standards as the program grows. We're really in a position where we need that. Um, and journals and, you know, kind of abstract and indexing are not, uh, is not as important. Yeah, I know. I'm still waiting on a revised license from, <laughs> from a couple of, um, of different potential solutions. But yeah, it is, uh, it's, you know, definitely a, uh, a challenge, but you know, at this point, uh, we sort of went with the idea that if we're going to teach our students that standards are are meant to be challenged, they're meant to be incorporated into your work, that it does have to do with with safety and uh, especially in the case of, say, medical devices um, and those kinds of, you know, engineering standards. Um, you know, if we're going to say this is important, uh, we need to give students the opportunity to read and also the opportunity to push back, um, I guess, against standards that may not be adequate for what they're trying to, um, what they're trying to um, explain or present. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you, Scar Scarlett. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> um, and I, I want to thank you for your presentation. I want to thank uh, the rest of your team, Greg and Phil, as well. Um, I want to ask one last time if there's any questions, please put them in the chat. And um, I want to thank everyone who joined us for the Knoxville Spring Meeting. I hope you enjoyed the presentations. Um, we also want to remind you to fill out the evaluation form. The link has been in the chat uh, prior. Um, but we appreciate your, your feedback and we appreciate your ideas for upcoming programs. Uh, so that's all that I have for today. Does anybody else have any announcements or questions? Yeah, so um, after I'm finished editing and processing, um, we will send out the link to anybody that may have joined late. So if you wanna review the entire program, it will be available at some point later this week.